The following conversation is with Andrew Maneshin, a Sydney-based coach. This was his very first podcast he's ever done. And I was very grateful to be able to hold that space to have a really great conversation on really diving into the deep weeds of psychology and habit building and how Andrew throughout his career and life and working with different clients works to facilitate building positive, constructive habits and a lot of the pitfalls and weaknesses and addictions that we all fall into. We talk about social media and how to manage the addictions around that. Addictions through drugs and gambling and porn, something that many people can relate to and how to actually interface and manage the the chaos that that can bring to someone's life and also how to find meaning and fulfillment in your own life. We talk about joy and fulfillment and happiness and what those things mean to us and how Andrew interfaces with that. And I hope you guys enjoy the conversation. It, it goes on health, but it goes on more than health. It talks about habits and it talks about psychology and really understanding human behavior from uh, managing from a, like a health professional perspective and, and even well beyond that from a perspective of, of a human being and how to take advantage of this brain, this very million, million, millions years old brain of ours. And I hope you guys can take something out of it. Enjoy. I try to look you up and I'm like, I always got to do research on my guests just, just, to, just to check them out and see their background because I don't know you that well, you know. And I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but I didn't see any podcasts that you've done before. Is that right? No, first one. Oh, really? Wow. Well, we're going we're gonna to dive in then because like I'm people don't know. It. Can you pronounce your last name for me? Maneshian. Maneshian. Thank you. All right. Well, look, one thing that stood out, like a couple places we can go. The first place I want to go is there's this quote. You might recognize it, okay? Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Yeah, it's in my Instagram bio, that one. That's my uh, phone background as well. Okay. What does that mean to you? That means to me just all the evils or like it's not necessarily to say purposeful evils in the world but all the evils that are in the world is just to you know stay strong stay faithful uh keep your values don't let all of them distract you from you know your path in the world so a real easy example I actually watched uh a social dilemma last night on netflix which was very interesting so yeah. just an interesting way in how people use their products not necessarily to manipulate you but their product is keeping you entertained on Facebook or Instagram, for example. So they, n- they might not necessarily have any evil plans for you, but regardless, if I'm on there 24 seven, it is in effect something evil to me because it's distracting me from my life. So mm. things like that, or just in general, you know, uh, you know, evil people, whatever, whatever it may be. So, you know, all the, all the bad stuff in the world, just trying to, you know, keep on the armor of God, keep your faith there and just stay away from all of that stuff. How do you then manage that? Because, it is so, it's never been, I feel like, easier to be addicted to things. Food, sex, money, status, power, um, social media. Like, have you interacted with that over your life? Yeah, yes. I've, I've, I've been addicted to something. Not, and like, it was when I was young and I didn't even know you could be addicted to something because this was like, it was 19 or something from memory. And at the time, my knowledge was, addiction is drugs that's it i didn't know you could be addicted to anything else mm. uh and then it started affecting my relationship with one of my exes and dove deep in there because i'm not the type where i'm an information junkie if i'm interested in something i want to know enough about it where i'm happy and then go from there mm. so i sort of dove deep down that rabbit hole on, on how addictions work and you know how it all works with reward centers and dopamine and all of that and then yeah once you understand how it works it's it is a lot easier to to face that addiction i found uh, it doesn't make it any any easier from like a chemical standpoint, but it's definitely easier. You know, when you find yourself doing it, you realize what's happening in your brain. You're like, all right, well, this is the reason. Maybe I can work around it. So, with everything going on, like I still fall prey to it. I, I still fall prey to it all the time. Like, uh, it's only been four weeks since I started trying to get off my phone again. Like, I, I su- succeeded in the past, and you fall back into that rabbit hole. It's mainly social media. This is my constant battle. So, you've probably seen on my Instagram. I, I'm not very active. 
Um, I know I should be for business, but at the same, it's like a double-edged sword. It's like, I know I need it for business, but at the same time, you're going to fall into that rabbit hole and then just freaking be on there all day doing lights and everything. So mm-hmm. it's definitely all about balance. Um, my way of dealing with it, really, real easy, is I uh, just keep the phone in the other room. Yeah. Um, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Very, very easy solution. Uh, everything else is more so just trying to replace all of the addictive behaviors. So like, have you have you happened to have read uh, Atomic Habits? I knew you were going to say that book because you're talking like you've read it. Yes, yeah. I just finished reading it. It is an, one of the best books on the psychology and human behavior aspect of changing habits I've ever read. Amazing, right? Absolutely it's, amazing. It's so simple too. Like it's it's easy to read. Like anybody can use it. It's crazy. It's crazy. So they... um. Yeah, so like, you know, in the original there was Q routine reward and then Atomic Habit, they go Q craving routine reward. Yeah. Very, yeah. very similar process. Um, and yeah, it was just, how good was like, you know, habit stacking or, you know, you're only aiming to do like a little 1% improvement and then all the explanations behind it. When you when you look at that and you try and apply it for someone, it's such a much more efficient and easier approach for people as opposed to, you know, quit smoking cold turkey. Well, good luck with that. All you're really going to do if you do that is you're just going to replace one dopamine habit for another. That's why you see people smoke and then all of a sudden they gain weight. Because mm. I, don't, I don't get my dopamine here, I get my dopamine from sugar now. It's just replacing one thing. And how important environment is, like, you, you know, how our environment triggers our behaviors, right? Like when I sit at this desk, you sit at that desk, we trigger certain behaviors. And I think we get the wires crossed so much between different habits. For example, my bed and bedroom is sleep. That's it. But so many people... They do a whole bunch of other activities in their bedroom, in their bed. And then yeah. they wonder why it's a struggle to down-regulate and fall asleep. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I remember, I'm pretty sure it was from Atomic Habits where they were saying, you know, uh, for example, you want to meditate. Yeah. Just do it in a different chair. Do it in a chair where you don't sit normally. Mm. So now your brain will wire that seat with that habit. And it was a, it's a really easy solution because um, I'm in the process of moving at the moment. Um, so I've only got, you know, my, my, uh, lounge room chairs and this computer chair. So I just sold my couch. I got another one. So at the moment I'm throwing a little bit off the routine. So something as simple as that, I normally sit. So for example, if I watch TV, I'm on, you know, the far side watching TV. If I meditate, I'm on the, on the near side of the couch. And now I've only got this nice one chair to sit in and I can already feel my meditation isn't the same as it used wow. to be. Like I'm struggling a bit with, with that, um, with that concentration. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's just it's absolutely fascinating how we work, and then all this new research coming out just it's absolutely mind blowing. But it just makes things easier for people in the long run. Like to know that information and to learn it. Yeah. Is there yeah. one particular point from that book? Like, there's a lot of sparks in that book. I'm like, yes, I can use that to myself and my clients. Did you have? Do you remember those moments in that book particularly? So it has been a while, but I do remember I was a big fan of the habit stacking. Yeah. So yeah. it's almost like, you know, rewarding yourself from doing something you need to do. It's something as simple as, let's say the habit is, or something you want to do is browse Facebook. It's like, all right, well, you don't have to not browse Facebook, but why don't you make sure you do something you need to do and reward yourself with that, you know, 10, 15 minutes on Facebook, which is, it's great because you, you're getting two things done. You're still doing what you need to do in life. And then, you know, you give yourself a little reward with the stuff you like to do. Um, then the other one was starting small, like that 1% increment mm. where, you know, something as simple as, oh, I can't get to the gym. I absolutely, you know, I'm anxious or whatever the reason that you can't get to the gym is. And just, you know, going in there for like bare minimum, like five minutes, five, like tr- pick up a dumbbell for five minutes, Literally. do that, walk out. People think it's a joke. Out. Like that's, ab- that's so serious though. Like go for a walk up and down your street once tomorrow, do it twice. Yeah. That, that's it I want to show you something because we're talking about it if you remember from the book in a part of the book um, they were giving examples of um, when you have to do a certain habit that has a time frame on it and it's really beneficial to give a visual cue of the progress you're making okay I'm not sure if you remember that so what I did um, I'm working with Ben Kant who's uh, an amazing coach and he you know, we've been in a deficit for a period of time, right? And it gets challenging when you when you uh, in a deficit for a long period of time. You're restricting yourself. I love food, so it can become mentally like a bit of a challenge. All right. So okay, I started playing this game where I would have one jar, it's empty, right? It's black. So there would be 
something in the jar I'm about to show you. And then every time a day passes, I put another Lego block in the other jar. And so I can physically see, so the gold is the next, like I'm progressing, like another day. So black jar, have them all to start with, right? I have three weeks in this next phase. There's uh, 21 little Lego blocks in here. And you can see tangibly with any habit, your progress. And it was beautiful. Yeah, that's so good. I got like, um, I do a bullet journal. Uh, oh, nice, I heard of those. My, my day. And then like in the, you know, see that there. So yeah, in yeah. the um, in the other section, I sort of go, you know, this is October habits, all the habits I want to do. You know, ticking them off if I've done them or not. Nice. It's the same thing, pretty much the same thing as what you're doing. But yeah, it's definitely so much better because you can actually see it. You can actually see the difference. And something as simple as you can apply that for, you know, let's say I'm coaching someone and they're trying to lose weight. And I, I've seen this myself. Uh, I actually had a very, very big example where. I gained a significant amount. It was a lot of body fat. It was the first, I was very, very young. I never wanted to lose my abs. So I gained a significant amount of weight. And after the time period, I didn't see nothing because, you know, you see yourself in the mirror every day, you know, all those little changes over time, you don't really notice it. All my friends notice the difference. And they're like, why don't you look at an old photo? Mm. You look at an old photo, I'm like, oh, okay, now I can see the difference. So it's so good. That's one of the reasons why you get people to check in with photos as well. Uh, because over time, you actually do see that difference, and it, it is a reminder, exactly like what you're doing with um, the jars and what I'm doing here. You see that difference. It just keeps motivating as you move forward. Exactly, because it can get overwhelming to think, okay, well, you want to do something, right? You want to change your body composition, right? You want to put on 10 kilos of muscle. You want to lose 5 kilos of fat. You want to start a business and make six figures. Like, these things take time, right? But to... I feel like to make it less overwhelming or to not like, we don't even need to look so far in the future. Just look at it as like a process, one day chipping away and then suddenly it makes it so much psychologically easier, I feel. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, and it's with all those little, it's like accumulation and if you get to a certain point, so for example, you don't, you don't want to break the chain at a certain point yeah. as well. If you just see all that and then all of a sudden you know you, you're going to mess it all up and you got to start from scratch, it's, mm -hmm. it just makes it... It's like, a, a, how are they saying it? The four steps are, you know, you've got to make it easy, make it hard, etc. So yeah. if you're like trying to break the habit, you want to, you know, put it out of sight and all of that. Um, and you, you want to make it undesirable. So this part of it, if I mess that up, it's now undesirable to me. It's like I messed that up. I, I feel guilty. You know, I let myself down kind of thing. A particularly interesting one for me that I've noticed in just watching human behavior and um, when you live with other people is particularly with the with food and just things that are in the open. For example, if you don't want to eat something because you know it's going to be deleterious to your health or it might make what you're trying to do harder, there is a huge difference between that something, that food being out in the open on the table or countertop versus being away in a cupboard because there's no trigger for cue or craving if you don't see it. And it's like, huh. That's like such a big thing. Small action that can have huge results. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. Um, and as addicted to... Oh, what's his name? Simon Zinnick is the guy that wrote... Uh, Start with why. Yeah. Um, I remember I watched one of his videos. It was like one of his videos that went viral. And as soon as it was all about being on your phone and, you know, our generation. And as soon as he said it, I was like, I need to get this phone out of my, out of my, I get, get it out of my vision. I don't even want to see it anymore. And that was like one of the first times I got on my phone. I was, it was very successful. Like so simple. The queue, not there, out of the room. I don't even think about it. Uh, but then there's obviously, how can we say there's harder habits to get rid of as well. So if you look at someone that's overweight or, you know, in a way addicted to food, yeah. that cue, even though, you know, it might not be uh, in sight, they still know it's there at the back of their mind. Yeah. So even if it's in the pantry, you sort of got to go that one step further, you know, out of the house, like mm. don't even have it in the house. Uh, and it does make it that bit easier. Oh, that's, I've, I've tried that in the past as well. And you find if it's not here in the house, then I need to put in that effort to go get that food, like I need to drive down to Woolworths and you know buy the food and etc. Then come all the way back home and can eat the food. That's effort. Mm. So like I've got to put in all this effort to eat this food that I want, and 
I'll tell you what, I've never went through the effort to go do all that. Yeah. At the end of the day, I'm like, oh, I can just eat something else. I'll just have some fruit or something else. And then you just, you're satisfied with that. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's just fascinating how we work. Absolutely. You watch the, um, well, actually, no, I want to backtrack. You said habits. I wonder, because I saw the little, um, the bullet journal. What are your, like, currently your, like, major non-negotiable habits that keep you healthy and sane that you need to do? Um, I would say my morning routine is the biggest thing. Uh, yeah, training as well. Training, eating relatively healthy. Like, I'm still following Dave's protocol for that as well. But the biggest thing is definitely the morning routine. So ever since I've been on my self-improvement journey, I've always had a decent morning routine. Uh, but after COVID happened, you know, when COVID first happened, uh, you know, being made redundant and everything from uh, clean health, you know, everything ended up being all right after that. But it, I was in a bit of a slump for about two, three weeks before I, I tried to wake myself up. I'm like, man, you gotta, you got to get out of this. you got to do something. Like, regardless if I don't have a job or not at this current moment, mm. I can't just let myself fall into uh, like a depression or anything. So I'm like, I'm going to start my old morning routine, get back into that. So, you know, meditating, journaling, uh, stuff like that. And then I thought, I want to take it that step further because part of my morning routine was also, oh, sorry, it wasn't my morning routine, but I was reading. I, I, I like reading and everything as well. That was one of the things uh, that I tried to replace a bad habit with. So, you know, you still get dopamine release as long as you're switching the dopamine release to a better form of, you know, uh, engagement. It's, it's going to be much healthier for you in the long run. So... I said, I want to go that step further. And I got this book called Miracle Morning. I can't remember how I stumbled across it, but highly recommend it. Like that's Atomic Habits is one of the best books I've ever read. Miracle Morning, Power of Now, they're probably, you know, top three, top five. They're some of the best books I've ever read. So what he's basically saying in the Miracle Morning is from me so say the so there's six very good habits that you can implement to make your whole life more productive. So I'm just going to try to remember them. So you got silence, which is meditation or some other form of silence. Uh, affirmations, visualizations, exercise. This doesn't have to be your full workout routine. It's just something to get you going in the morning. Um, reading and journaling was the last one. So I started implementing all of those. And they, they don't have to be the traditional method of doing it. Like, mm. for example, I do bullet journaling. You know, other people may like to, you know, dear diary, I did this and this and this. It's, you know, up to everyone. Uh, but I found that even though I can't do a full amount of everything, I'm still getting something done. So, for example, the reading. Again, I love reading, but if I have a big, long work day and I'm stressed out and I come home, I don't want to read. You know, I just want to chill out for a little bit and do something else. But if I get some reading done in the morning, you know, it's done. I've done something, which is better than, you know, never doing it in the first place. So even if I read five pages, well, if I've got some time later, I can read again. If I don't, I've still done something. And I just found that all of those major things uh, that he recommends just helps to get you, you know, for example, visualization, you know, I visualize uh, the broader picture of my goals uh, you know, moving forward. And then I also visualize at the end of that, you know, my day. So even that, that just gets your mind straight. And the meditation obviously gets you centered. Uh, you know, affirmations get you, you know, on the right track. Uh, gratitude journaling as well. That's, you know, reminds of all the good in your life. So all of those things are just putting you in a positive state for your whole day and it's just a great habit that's probably the best habit i've ever implemented in my life yeah so in that case here's the thing it's not one single habit it's a collection of habits that are adding up and preparing you to maximize your day is that is that what i'm hearing yeah definitely definitely man that's it's really interesting how we've started the conversation it's like i feel like people we get in the weeds so much about the theory of and science of this and that but when it comes down to it you have to understand how to hack and change your behavior in your brain and that is hugely dependent on changing habits when you were younger because people look at you now and that they see like i feel like they see a finished product right i know you of course no one's finished you're not finished you're still working but at a very, very respectable, admirable level that you've pushed your body and mind to, right? And business and everything. But if we go back to like a teenage Andrew, what was he like? Oh, teenage Andrew. Like 18, very, very... 17? So I was very shy. 
uh, as a teenager, so very, very shy, um, which looking back on it, that sort of came from my addiction, uh, you know, addiction, anxiety, dopamine problems and all of that. Uh, in saying that, the part that I didn't understand was I was extremely headstrong and I had so much willpower, it was just absolutely ridiculous. So um, if I if I had a goal at that point in time, I, I reached it. Like I, I would, you know, hell or high water, I would reach it. Uh, almost to the point where it was too much. So I sort of learnt my lesson. This was, I was doing Olympic weightlifting and martial arts at the time. They were my two trainings. And I would push through anything to reach my goal, which, you know, sounds great, but I took it too far. Like I, I pushed through an injury. I ended up tearing my patella tendon, you know, just because I was like, no, nah, I don't care how much it hurts. I'm pushing through anything. I'm going to do this. Uh, so, yeah, I learnt my lesson there. So I was too, a bit too headstrong uh, on that regard. Was very how can I say, a bit of brain fog in in terms of things that I didn't find interesting. So, for example, at school, I wasn't the best student just purely because I, I, I even to this day, I struggle to pay attention to things that I'm not interested in. Um, so, for example, English, I didn't do the best at it. And I still speak, I still write everything, I still spell all the words and talk properly. Uh, but just the creative side of things, it's never really been me. I've always struggled with the creative side of things and I remember back in the day they used to say, you know, you're either the creative type or, you know, English and arts or you're more like science and maths. And I've always found I'm more science and maths. So in school I did very well at maths, I did very well at science and everything else was not so much. So it wasn't to say that, you know, I was, you know, dumb or anything like that. It's just I couldn't pay attention and I just couldn't couldn't do it. Uh, but yeah, apart from that, shy, anxious, uh, just trying to think what else, what else with me. Yeah, so that pretty much pretty much me just trying to look back on it how did you realize to change those things about you and to realize maybe there were weaknesses and to do something about them so to give you an example of just how shy i was uh i couldn't talk to an adult that i didn't know i couldn't look them in the eyes like i just it just i don't know i just couldn't do it hmm. so extremely shy but funnily enough, as a kid, like as a, you know, eight, eight year old or whatever, I was fine. It was just like normal. So I realized that this was getting to be an issue. I'm like, oh, you know, I can't grow up and live the rest of my life like this. I got to do something about it. So pretty much like what uh, Atomic Habits is saying, start small and build yourself up. I started just purely with the eye contact stuff. So just bit by bit, you know, I just want to hold on to eye contact. I don't care how uncomfortable it is. I want to slowly build that up. And I did. It took time, but eventually I did build that up to the point where it may have gone too far. Like, I think I got a little bit carried away to the point where I was just staring at everyone until they looked away. Um, and it, it's probably getting a little bit intimidating, but I'm like, I, I didn't have the purpose of doing it to be intimidating. I'm like, I just want to make sure I reach my goal. Yeah. Uh, but then eventually I'm like, I, I think I'm freaking people out a little bit, so I back <laughs> off that. So, yeah, that's how I overcame that. And then bit by bit, you know, just slowly putting myself in more and more uncomfortable situations till I got over my fears. Uh, something, again, another another funny little thing. Uh, I grew up pretty much with my mum. So uh, parents got divorced when I was very, very young. So looking back on it, you know, being mothered too much was another reason why it was so hard to step out of my comfort zone. Because, you know, in general, you know, your mum always wants you to be really safe. And, you know, if you get hurt, they freak out and all this. They don't rough you up like your dad would. So my mum was absolutely horrified of cockroaches. And which made me horrified of cockroaches. Uh, and then growing up, I'm like, man, I can't be a fucking man and be scared of cockroaches. I've got to do something about this shit. So eventually, uh, first time, I think I was like 16 or 17 or something. And I finally, I, like, this is when I was trying to get over all this stuff. And I finally, eventually, I saw one. I'm like, I got to do it. I, I got to kill this thing. I'm going to do it. And anyway, I jeeped myself up for about five minutes. It was ridiculous. And eventually, I, I stomped the shit out of this thing. Like, I, I, I could have probably broken someone's leg. That's how hard I kicked oh, it. But, but overkill. So anyway, it's just slowly, slowly building yourself up and overcoming those things. So yeah, now that stuff's not an issue. You know, eye contact, not really an issue. Cockroaches, whatever, kill them, all good. Um, so yeah, just baby steps. So like, I'm unknowingly trying to do some of the things that are in Atomic Habits, just bit by bit. Did you? How did you know to do that? Like, because you had this interesting intrinsic willpower and discipline inside of you it sounds like but did you have like a mentor or a book or resource something you saw you read that informed you to take that action not a not a not a mentor or anything like that uh my 
sensei at the time when I was doing martial arts, he sort of took the role as a father figure for a little bit. So he did toughen me up a bit. I'd say a bit would have come from there because uh, there was a lot of uncomfortable situations in that. So, yeah. for example, uh, we would have to get, so like we'd get uh, someone else to get us in a rear naked choke and the object was, you know, they're going to put it on as hard as they can. But we have to stand up and walk to the other side of the room and they'll let go. So it's like, you know, getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Uh, the other one, I know it's probably a little bit strange and old school, but, you know, it is what it is. Same thing, rear naked choke, and it was learning to hold on as as long as you can. And we sort of called it curtains down. So it's like as soon as you feel like you're just about to pass out, you got to tap. So learning to be um, comfortable with the uncomfortable. Uh, and, you know, that's two examples of many that was at, um, from martial arts. So I'd say a lot of it would have come from that. So there was – and at the same time, I, I, was, I was a competitive kid. So, you know, whatever it took in, in martial arts to, you know – be as good as what I could be, I was doing it. Um, you know, I went out of my way to stretch. I'm pretty sure from memory it was an hour every night so I could do the split side, I could do the split front. Um, I was just extremely flexible as well. So yeah, I'd say I'd say a big part of it would have been would have been developing all that, you know, mental toughness from, from martial arts. Yeah, is it did you see you did? Uh, I was doing oh, man, I, I wish I'd I, if I could go back in time I would have chose a different martial art. But in saying that, you know, it is what it is. Um, I still did learn a lot from it. I did ninjutsu. Uh, which was, it was almost like heart-wrenching when the initial UFCs came on, uh, when, when I did watch them at the time, uh, when you see, you know, for example, a kickboxer faces karate and, you know, a wrestler faces uh, Muay Thai or whatever it may be. Uh, I remember I was so excited, I saw the ninjutsu guy get in there and he got slammed on my arm. Man, I chose the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways... Oh, Eventually, I, I progressed into something but else. But it's interesting. I don't know the diff- what's the difference in ninjutsu because if you look at a guy like the Gracie family and Hoist Gracie, like they dominated through jiu-jitsu and through being smaller bodies, able to tactfully and technically uh, master that art. So, with, so ninjutsu is basically the art of the ninja. That's what they did. And that's, you know, when I, I started when I was 15 and, you know, you know, I wanted to do the cool thing. Well, I am a ninja. It would be awesome to do it. Uh, in saying that, I did learn a lot of things that most martial arts don't do. There was a lot of, of weapons training, so I do know how to use a katana. Um, it was a little bit of training with nunchucks, a little bit of ninja stars. We had the naginata, which is the really long stick with the blade at the top. Um, so all that stuff was awesome. Uh, even the you know the self defense in itself that was good too. But when you look at how the movement is compared to traditional striking, so for example boxing or muay thai, mm. striking in let's say so let's say boxing. You know, you're always standing in your stance. You know, you've got your left foot forward, uh, left hand forward, right hand back, blocking. And you normally you punch in the same position. So your legs stay in the same position as you're punching. You know, you, you move them, but your stance is always left forward, right back. Whereas with ninjutsu, it's it's kind of the same for a jab, but you, you always sort of stay. It's so much body weight based as opposed to athletic and fitness based. So, for example, uh, the left punch. You would punch, but you would completely step in with all your body weight for that left punch. And in the right punch, your your right leg would also step forward as you right punch. So it's very, very different to traditional uh, boxing. But it still did work. Like for, for a straight situation, it would be, you know, fairly effective. Um, but, yeah, so, yeah, that's that's basically the difference. Do you – have you done any martial arts – I mean, when we could, did you do any other martial arts recently over the last couple of years? So I had a break – so what was that? I was 15 to 19. I did uh, ninjutsu. I stopped till about 22 and started up again. Reason being is that transition. When I was 18 and I tore my patella tendon, I was. It took a year. It took it took about a year before I could train heavy again. So it took a very long time to recover that. Uh, so you know, last thing I wanted to do was anything that was going to irritate it. And I tried a few movements and I was like, no, nah, I'm not going to risk it. So. Anything that was explosive at that point hurt. Mm. Uh, and then that's why I transitioned from Olympic weightlifting to powerlifting because, funnily enough, the heavy stuff was fine. It was just the real explosive movements. So I was like, you know what, I'll have a break. Uh, eventually at 22, then I started up again. And I managed, I think it was for a year. Uh, and then it just got to the point where being on your, you know, being on the floor all the time, you know, being on your hands and, ne- and knees and feet, there was so much pressure on my knee to the point where it felt the same way as what it felt when I tore it just before I had tore it initially. And I just had to weigh up the options and was, you know, am I going to 
you know, tear it again and, you know, be too hard mentally like I was last time and then not walk for a bit or, you know, tough it out, like tough it out and have a break from it for a while as badly as I wanted to do it, I had to take the break. Uh, then a few years after that, after learning a bit more with, uh, I learned from Tony Bataji who taught me a lot about rehab. Uh, like rehab and prehab and how to fix injuries and, you know, proper muscular balance. So I always sort of knew the polyclon stuff, you know, rotator cuff sort of balance, you know, for your bench press and everything, but I didn't know much about lower body because polyclon never taught that stuff, whereas Tony Bataji did. So I implemented that for a while and then bit by bit over the years, finally my knees started to get to the point where they, they almost felt back to normal. So I started up Muay Thai at first. I thought, you know what, I'll do Muay Thai. I don't have to be on my knees. It's obviously going to be less strain uh, than what I felt when I did jiu-jitsu just from, from memory. So I did that for a little bit, and then even that started to irritate the knees. So I'm like, all right, back off. I'm like, what can I do? I, I really wanted to do something fighting, uh, it's like some form of martial arts. So eventually I transitioned to boxing, me thinking that there is less legs than, you know, uh, Muay Thai. You obviously still use your legs a lot, but you're not actually hitting with them. And so, yeah, eventually I, I, I went to boxing for three years, and... Yeah, legs were fine. Over those years, you know, strengthened everything up more and more. And from there, I started back up full on MMA. And ever since, everything has been really good. So, very, oh. very happy with it. So, you're still doing it? Yeah, yeah. Are you planning on, do you, do you think you'd ever do an amateur fight? Oh, I don't know. I, got, I have thought about it. But at the same time, I, like, I don't, I don't like to place limitations on myself. But there's always my age at the back of my mind. I'm like, do I really want to do this at this age? Like, do I want to do it just for the sake of doing it? Or am I going to go all out and go all in? So I know that, you know, 32 is not that old, but, you know, not having any actual fight experience um, and, you know, not being too high a level at, at what I am doing, I would have to go all in to get there. And I'm the type, it was the same thing with the bodybuilding. If I, if I feel like I've got more to work on, I'm not even going to be happy to walk on stage. So I'd rather, you know, I, I turned every stone, I did everything I could, then I'll go do it. So I think I'd have to sort of do the same thing with yeah. uh, MMA. So if, I, if, I, if I'm like, yep, 100%, I feel like, you know, done everything I could, I'm at a very good level, I'd jump in the ring, yeah. How did you, I want to go back, because you said uh, what you learned from Tony with the rehab stuff. What did you learn from him that really changed the way that your body performed and ability to recover and be more robust? So Tony's Tony's courses are absolutely amazing. He's he's still to this day probably one of the best that I've that I've uh, learned from. He was very good with teaching uh, periodization. Uh, sorry, uh, programming. And within his programming, he would advocate you know prehab, regardless if you have an injury or not, always prehab. Uh, and there was always balance in the programs. Like the balance in the programs is fairly straightforward. I've always done that stuff. Whereas for prehab, I've always had a decent idea on the basics you know, rotator, trap three, all of that. But he just went sort of way more into depth. So to the point where he would even be talking about um, forearm, forearm extensor and flexor ratio, so having the proper ratio and strength between them, uh, and how most elbow problems can be fixed by fixing up that, that strength or that ratio in between them. Um, yeah, all the basics, trap three and external rotators. He would also talk about this stuff I knew from the weightlifting days because when you did weightlifting, there's proper ratios and like these, they've done it for years, like decades, they, they've known this stuff. So, you know, your back squat is, a, you base everything off that, that's 100%. Your front squat is 80% of that. And you know, there's all these other percentages that need to be based off that back squat. And he had the same, uh, pretty much the same thing, but he also took it that step further. Like I was saying with the forearms, he also took into account uh, tibialis anterior. So, you know, everyone's always doing calf raises this way, but no one ever does this way. Uh, so something as simple as that, I started adding them in. Uh, my problem, which I found, was my uh, glute med, so yeah. doing hip abductions. Yeah. So knowing that they, they work together, so my problem, the reason looking back on it, I'm still not 100% sure why I had the tear, but, you know, I've spent so long analysing, like, what did I do wrong? How can I fix it up? And trying all of that. So what I... Am concluding, guessing though, uh, is I was so flexible everywhere else. I could do side splits, front splits. I could, you know, if you do that hamstring stretch, I could get my nose to my knee. So I was like super flexible. That over under um, shoulder stretch, I could grab my arms like that. So extremely flexible. But looking back on the hip flexor uh, and rec fem, 
when you're doing those stretches, I think I was collapsing my pelvis as opposed to, you know, tucking the pelvis in and squeezing the glutes. So looking back on it, I think that was extremely tight, whereas everything was extreme, everything else was extremely loose. So I think that's why uh, the problem came there in the first place. Then all the physios that I went to said, the issue that I have is my uh, vastus medialis is much weaker compared to the other quad muscles. So all, they go all the other three are big and strong. They go, that's weak abs. So I'm like, all right, I'll try and strengthen it. And then I did all the traditional uh, VMO exercises like your Peterson step up, Holton step up, um, things like that. So like sissy squats, stuff like that. None of them worked. So pretty much everything I did still hurt and I still felt vastus uh, lateralis. So I'm like, well, I'm trying to do everything that I should. It just wasn't working for whatever reason. And the biggest thing that I took away from Tony Bataji was you've got to train those hip abductors because they work together. Um, and then my biggest light bulb moment to just how weak it was. So up to that point, when I started training with him, I think it was two years after I did my last powerlifting competition. Um, and just for like point of reference, I unofficially broke the under 90 kilo Australian deadlift record. So I did 320 kilos at 89. Um, just so you sort of understand that level of strength. Mm. Then when I tested my hip abductor strength, I was training one of my clients. She was, from memory, my client could squat 50, 60 kilos, nothing too crazy, but she was perfect form doing cable hip abductions with about eight kilos. And I went to do my hip abductions, I was doing like four. So just to see that that imbalance, like was just extremely imbalanced. So yeah, ever since I, I started focusing on that, like everything started to get much stronger. It is so common and working with a lot of athletes and observing a lot of them, um, we see that when we improve the hip stabilizers, the external rotators of the hip, so the glutes, the three glutes, especially medius and minimus, like good, very good things happen. Lower back pain diminishes. Um, people improve their gait mechanics, their sprinting mechanics, their ability to stabilize and coordinate off one leg. Um, that seems to be like, you know, Charles talks about rotator cuff so much being so important for the shoulder complex and upper body. M to me, the hip abductors are the same thing, but for the hips and lower extremities. That's what the conclusion I'm coming to. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And a lot of people are very weak there. It's, sure. I'd assume based off, um, you know, Kelly Starrett, um, where they say, you, you familiar with Kelly? Yeah, I love Kelly. Yeah. So where he's saying, you know, um, why standing desks are so important, um, why we shouldn't be sitting down. Bro. Um, you've got one, I know. Oh yeah, of I've course you do. You've seen it so many times. <laughs> so, same, same thing, I've got one too. So this one goes Oh, up. how good so, is it? Yeah. Oh, it's amazing, amazing. Um, so yeah, so like how he's saying, you know, if you're sitting down all day, obviously your hip, hip flexors are getting much tighter, your glutes are getting weaker, your upper back's rounding, etc. Uh, and I think a big part to play why all of our, you know, hip abductors and just glutes in general are so bad is because, you know, we're born and raised to sit down. Our society sits down from mm. school, sit down all day. And I think that's a big reason why it happens. Yeah, and Kelly's initiative that he's doing with um, the, the stand-up company that he has, putting all these standing desks in schools, I think is so great. And he's he initially, like, I think I heard the idea from him when I was in, I ought to be doing one of my diplomas. Um, and... I was really getting into his content many years ago and we're sitting in class just learning and I'm just like, I'm just going to get into a, a, a knee down split squat, squeeze my glute and just rock back and forth here. And I, you know, you, you're in class, right? So you obviously going to look a bit weird with that guy, that guy over there who's not sitting, but you know, as a practical game changing little 1% habit, if every hour or so, if you just incorporate that, you can really create some huge change and mitigate a lot of these musculoskeletal issues that end up being big issues in the future. Yeah, definitely, definitely. There's um, Ido Portal. Yeah. It's like, because, uh, you know, if you go to the gym and you don't look weird, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> Along the lines of that was his quote. Oh, but it's, it's, he's the perfect guy for that. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, but it's so true. It's like he's, he's pretty much saying, you know, we're made to move. And yeah. it's, it's true. Like, as uh, we tend to get older, you just, you know, for example, grandmas, grandpas, you can just think they stop moving and then all of a sudden because they stop moving, they just, they can't move anymore because they, they didn't move. Um, and same thing, I've, I've tried to get my grandma to start walking regularly. So I've got her a little Fitbit. I've got, you know, synced up to my phone. So whenever nice. I see her, I think she's been, she's been walking enough. Uh, and ever since she's been actually moving, she feels better. 
it's just it's just so like it's just so common. It's the same thing if you don't stretch anymore, or you're going to get tighter. You don't you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah, and and the the measuring thing is interesting because what gets measured gets managed, with that famous quote. But also, I found that when you start measuring things, not only do you get a greater height of self awareness about them, and you your your perception of reality is much more accurate because you think you're doing one thing, but maybe you're doing another. But at least in my experience and some of my clients, like they want to do a better job at it. Like once you start having a watch that counts your steps and you know you're only hitting X steps and you want to hit Y steps, suddenly it's like, oh, I'm not doing enough. All right, time to go for more incidental activity. Uh, let's go for more walking, more daily walks. Like, and suddenly, and I can notice because I've stopped it for a period of time now, I'm not going as many walks. It's very interesting observation. Yeah, yeah. It's it's you could align that to say calorie tracking as well. Sure. But people just assume uh, I'm eating healthy. I'm you know eating low calories. Well, it's like well, no. There's, How many there's times do you hear that, Andrew? I'm eating oh. healthy. What the hell oh. does that mean? <laughs> Someone tell me what that means. <laughs> oh man, it's just it's ridiculous. Like technically, you know, every whole food is healthy. But at the end of the day, something as simple as you know, area I grew up in is there's uh, a lot of Lebanese. Um, and there's so many uh, nut shops they have around this um, in, the, in the area that I sort of grew up. And, you know, nothing like, nothing against nuts. Nuts are free, almonds, Brazil nuts, they're all great. But this place I went to, they do, you know, roasted and they're salted nuts. And they're healthy, right? Nuts are healthy. But what's bad about nuts? But then you look at it, you're like, well, one handful is, I don't know, three, 400 calories. And you don't stop there. But well, plus they, you know, they're just so addictive. I remember I had a whole one of those jars that you just pulled up. I had a whole one of those, and you, I just demolished the whole jar. Like you just can't stop. And the same thing, you know, keep keep it out of my sight, otherwise I'm going to destroy it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it's not many people control the amounts they eat as well. So, average person, if they had those uh, eating almonds or something, and you know, oh, but I'm eating healthy. It was like, well, how many calories is in your healthy? And yeah, they just don't even consider that. Like another example is. A comp prep client. She came to me last minute, and but she was an old client, so she started with me, um, and she went to I can't remember the other coach, but then she went to one of the judges, and then she came back to me, and her diet was all messed up. I fixed everything up, and she just wasn't making progress. And like I, I made like I know I've known this girl for a long time. She wasn't lying to me, and I knew she wasn't lying because we eventually figured out what the problem was. She was eating healthy. All the food was healthy. She was having five meals a day, which is, you know, too much looking back on it these days. But regardless, you know, f from example, what uh, Dave was saying, you know, eat every four to five hours. So now, with that knowledge, we're like, all right, well, the old school bodybuilding wasn't as good. Anyway, we figured out what the problem was. She was in a deficit. She was a bigger girl. Um, from memory, her maintenance was like 3,000. At this really? point in concrete. So she, yeah, was, she, she had a lot of muscle on her too, huh? Yeah, she was a tank. Damn. Um, so I think at this point I had her on roughly 1,800 from memory and she wasn't making progress. And I'm like, you should be losing pretty quick on these calories. And she just wasn't. And then, you know, just analyzed everything. I, you know, I even, I dropped down to 1,600, nothing happened. I'm like, all right, I'll go, so, you know, having any milk in your coffee, like just reassuring because we've been over this stuff the last time I trained her. I just assumed she was on, you know, switched on about it. And she's like, no, nah, no milk in the coffee. I'm like, hey, you put an extra oil on your foods? Her face went white. I'm like, what, 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 what'd you do? What'd you do? She goes, oh no, I've been putting extra oil. I'm like, how much? She goes, I'm not even measuring it. I'm like, oh my God. But anyway, I told her, I go, estimate it based off what you've been doing. How much do you reckon? She goes, she reckons she was putting three tablespoons of olive oil on every meal. Woo! That's five meals a day. We worked it out from memory. I think it was, it was over a thousand calories extra she was having a day unintentional. She just went over her head. She just... Bro. Forgot. Here's the thing, oil is one of the most calorically dense, because it's fat, right? So it's already the second most calorically dense behind alcohol, and then it's super easy to go heavy on oil and, and just top up on calories. That's really interesting. Yeah, and that's the thing where, when a lot of people say they eat healthy, yeah. how do most people cook their food? They don't count their oil. Yeah. They just drizzle that yeah. shit on and start cooking. It's such a tough thing that... It's such a tough thing to manage. I don't know if you have any tips on it because one, uh, that you can put olive oil, for example, in salads, right? 
And then two, you generally use certain oils um, in pan frying um, or stir frying, for example, whatever you're doing, even baking. And we're getting into a bit of weeds right here, but we all know, like, not all of the oil you put in the pan or put in the salad is going to be consumed. It's going to uh, drip down. Some of it's going to get evaporated. Some of it's going to get displaced um, through into the pan. Like, do you have any tips on what people can do to, to measure that? I literally just get a, a measuring a measuring teaspoon and make sure I get it right every time. Either that or you try get a... Look, I'm not a big fan of your traditional non-stick because there's so many toxins in it. Yeah. Um, but I have found, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but I did find a, a non-stick, non-toxic uh, pan. So if someone's trying to get, uh, you know, minimize the oils, that would be another good option as well. Pretty much, you know, not giving any oil calories. Do you, this? It's an interesting topic. Not many people talk about it. Um, I've been doing a little bit of research into like how harmful some of the chemicals that can get leached from pans into our food, right? Depending on the particular... Uh, compound that they're made from. Do you know much about that? Have you looked into that? I'm not sure in terms of how much it leaches out, um, but I was I was actually pretty surprised. Like just your standard your standard pans these days, unless someone's gone, um, you know, for stainless steel, which these days most people just want to go Teflon. Um, but they're from memory, it's PUFA something. Yeah, like and PFA PFAS yeah. as well. Yep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's actually worrying. Like your your average pans that people get these days, you don't have all these toxins in them. For sure, it's just scary. I got. To, I'm just pulling something up right now um, from Dr. Mark Hyman that made me uh, more aware of this. So non stick non stick cookware like Teflon is like one of the worst offenders for this. They have uh, things like PF PFAs, PFOAs, um, which when exposed to heat. They release carcinogenic compounds, okay, which can cause havoc and inflammation throughout the body. And things with like ceramic coatings on them as well can leach heavy metals like cadmium and lead, especially if they're old. And now we can suddenly get metal toxicity from the pans and we don't even know it. Yeah, yeah, it's very scary. And that's the even scarier thing is that that's only one avenue of what we do with day to day. Um, mm-hmm. When I was younger, I it was the, the uh, what's it BPA, so the BPA free stuff. Yep. Um, did my research when I was younger and started uh, looking into all the things that contain it. It was just ridiculous. So, uh, you know, your water bottles, you know, uh, food stories, stuff like that. Um, and then eventually, I started looking into your soaps and your shampoos. Um, mm-hmm. Just there's toxins everywhere in yeah. our environment. It's just ridiculous. Uh, there are ways around it. It's just you need to be aware of it. You need to educate yourself on it. Well, for me, like one of the biggest things that I've done to manage that is glass. Okay, glass. Not only, to my knowledge, I've never seen it being able to secrete anything toxic in it, but it's also very recyclable. Like it's, it's, it's. What I mean is the process to recycle glass is quite efficient compared to something like plastic. Do you have like, you know, what to- like when you manage someone's health? You want to get the big rocks first. Nutrition, sleep, habits, for sure. We're like in the more of the details here, but do you have certain techniques or things that you do to manage these little insidious things that add up? So more so just... Because um, a big part of my approach with training clients, so like obviously the training is a big part too, but I really try and focus on nutrition just because hmm. someone's trying to you know, gain or lose... You know, as, as hard as you train, you know, for example, you want to bulk. You train as hard as you want, but if you're in a deficit, you're going to find it very hard to put on muscle. And then same thing, vice versa. So a big part of what I do is focusing on educating them on nutrition. So bit by bit within those conversations, you're just sort of, you know, explaining something else. So like once they understand enough about nutrition, you know, we can move on to, you know, toxins in your soaps and et cetera. And then food storage, uh, you know, glass bottles, like you're saying as well. Um, but yeah, again, same thing as you said. You do want to focus on the big pictures first. It's almost like if you give every everyone everything to start with, it's, it's just too overwhelming. Yeah. yeah, so it's just too much. Um, so yeah, like you said, big picture items first. Um, and yeah, they're also going to get the results. They buy in. You start educating more. You know, every now and then might send them an article or something you find, or even an Instagram post, and it will tag them in it. And the more exposure they get to these things, the more likely they are to want to adapt them for themselves. And I found as well. You know, myself included, like once you start to see how harmful certain things are for you, 
I, like I just can't do it anymore. For example, um, doing Dave's protocol, I finished, uh, I can't even remember all the phases off the top of my head, but I finished the negative gram bacteria phase and afterwards got my blood test back and you know, there was massive, massive improvements. And he said, all right, look, have two weeks back on maintenance and he goes, you know, have a cheat meal or whatever and then we'll get back onto it in a couple of weeks. I'm like, all right, great. So I'm like, you know what? I, I didn't even, I just wanted one night, I just wanted one night with a little bit of junk food and I'm like, that's it, I'll, I'll call, it, call it a night after that. And I go into my pantry and I start looking at the labels and like, I know most about the, all these little ingredients beforehand, but I didn't realize how much of an impact they're actually having on your system. Uh, so I'm looking at these labels and I'm like, I can't eat it. I can't, I can't do it. Like I can't bring myself to eat this junk food knowing what this does to you inside. Um, and again, obviously most people don't understand how extreme it is until like, you know, you learn from someone like Dave, it's just, it's just insane how much damage you what what society consider, considers as, as acceptable foods how much damage these foods are doing to so, you. So uh, first I want to give context. We're talking about David O'Brien who I've talked to on this podcast before. You guys can go check that out. It's a four hour conversation of just knowledge bombs and just craziness. But for for you, Andrew, what, what are those things that people don't realize? Like what are the, the compounds and foods that you're thinking of that people don't realize? So because I've tried to explain this to a few client, clients as well and Again, as he said, like with Dave, there's just information overload and yeah. I cannot do him justice whatsoever. So I've tried to think of just one easy example uh, that would help explain to people, you know, a basic example of how much damage it's doing. And for me, I found that the hyperpermeability thing was fairly easy to explain. So the intracellular type junctions. Um, and, you know, just to explain it so like this. So in our epithelium, which lines your small intestine, large intestine, uh, stomach and your lung tissue, We've got intracellular type junctions. Now, 2,000 years ago, it's very rare that we're going to see any of these problems because everything's working as it should. Everything's organic. There's no things that are going to be, you know, impacting us in a negative way. Maybe, maybe alcohol back then, depending how crazy they went. Um, but so, if we look at if we look at that structure, uh, we've got alcohol, sugars, uh, artificial sweeteners, artificial preservatives, and gluten directly damage that structure. And those five things are like things that you know most people deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, like multiple of them, not just one. So they're damaging that structure directly. And over time, those tight junctions eventually get looser. And this is where a lot of damage occurs, um, you know, permeability, all the bad things that shouldn't be getting through, start getting through and cause damage. Uh, and again, as you know, that's just one avenue on how all these problems come to be. So yeah, it's actually very, very scary. Yeah, and it's it's, it compounds, right? We talk about 1% of habits positively. It's like it's the opposite in this direction because it's now negative 1% is slowly degrading. It's people don't realize. It's like I see it so often is like people will make comments about certain side effects and symptoms that they may have and or they might reach a certain body weight. And I'm like, what? I'm this body weight. It's like that was slow 1% decisions that chipped away over weeks, months, and years, and are gonna now take some time to address. Yeah, definitely, definitely. One of the um, the examples on how addictions and behavior happen. Yeah. The example yeah. that I remember reading was, think of uh, an open field of grass. So, and this is the equivalent to your neurons when we start looking at pathways. So. If I walk down a certain direction on this grass uh, a certain amount of times, eventually, you know, a pathway is going to form. And that's the equivalent of you forming a new pathway. Sure. So if we get a trigger on something that we want to do, you know, whatever it may be, you know, I want to go eat or, you know, I want to watch, you know, TV, whatever it is, we all, we're always going to seek the path of least resistance. So if we're used to getting our dopamine hit, and this is a problem with technology. So it's, again, it's a double edged sword. Let's use a gambling as an example because it's you know it's a touch of a button. If I get a dopamine hit from gambling and all I have to do is touch a button, so that's the equivalent. My brain just said I want dopamine. My brain knows the easiest neural pathway to access, so the path of least resistance is pressing a button, as opposed to reading a book and getting some dopamine. My brain's going to be like, well, couldn't be bothered with that book. That's too much effort. I can get my dopamine by pressing a button here. Uh, and this is how you start. You know, they say neurons that wire together fire together. Um, 
I'm sorry, the other way around, fly together, wire together. So, and this is the problem with so many different things that we have in our society, where if we learn how to deal with that and if we educate people, you know, as which I'd love for it to happen, there are ways to fix that. So that same pathway, for example, if we purposely stop, and again, this is where you can use atomic habits to learn to do something else. So for example, reading the book, eventually if we stop going over this pathway, the grass is going to grow back over. And then if we go down the other pathway, eventually the pathway forms there and our brain doesn't want to go down this pathway anymore because that neural pathway is closed up now. So that's, it's just a, an interesting analogy on how it works. So just so people can kind of understand. No, it. that's a really good analogy. It makes a very, you know, puts it into a, like a tangible visual thing. Um, I wonder for you, I always wonder for people who are highly successful and, and you know, epitomize an excellent symbol of health. You know, a guy like Dave, Dave O'Brien, right? He represents, like, to me, a guy who's doing almost everything possible to govern his human machine as, as well as possible, right? And it almost... They almost seem people like him too perfect because it's like, well, damn, Dave, do you not experience any of the, uh, I don't know, cues or cravings, or do you not enjoy any of the gluttonous pleasures of modern society? Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. I haven't gotten him to open up and talk about it yet. But on the last, I think, recording and and, and a class we did with him, he did mention that he even he himself like mentioned that I'm. I'm not always perfect. I have days where I slip or I, I'm not 100% there. And I would love to hear more about wh- how he slips and like wh- where he, you know, his kind of weaknesses are. But for you, Andrew, like, what are they for you in an effort to humanize you? Like, it's definitely not perfect. <laughs> I slip up, I slip up <laughs> like everyone else. Uh, I think, I think the reason why how can I say? I think the reason why I may not slip up as much as the average person is just, first of all, like from the habit stuff. So again, if you've formed good habits, that's why it's going to be so much, you know, you're not just going to fall back into a bad habit like that. Yeah. Uh, but if I do slip up, my problem is, which I've thankfully dealt with recently again, um, was like the phone. So phone, I always, you know, find myself just browsing too much. And again, like we said, double-edged sword, people do need it for business, but it, it is trying to learn to find that balance. Um, and there were actually a few, surprisingly, a few good ideas on uh, the social dilemma, especially learning how social media systems work. Then you sort of can think of some ideas on how to attack it back. Something as simple as getting rid of all your, you know, all your non-essential notifications, uh, which is what I've done. And again, you have to have an honest conversation with yourself because, as good as I may seem with a lot of my habits, if I'm, I'm, you know, weak inside just like everyone else. Like everyone has their weaknesses. And especially how they've wired social media, they've they've wired it to play on our weaknesses, to make us come back on there as much as possible. Because for them, the more that people are on social media, the better for them, the better for business. You know, more advertisement, more screen time, etc. So, me looking at my at my notifications, like you know, first first thing in there, and it's interesting because I I did have a client, uh, sorry, a mate that needed to do it as well. So I was paying attention to what I was thinking while I was doing it. And I'm looking at these notifications and, for example, I've got some app on there where I'm like, oh, but, you know, I may I may need to hear... You justify it. Then, yeah, you justify it. And then you think about it really. I'm like, no, I don't I don't need these notifications. Um, and then something as simple as this morning, I, I deleted... Uh, I didn't delete it completely. I deleted Facebook off my phone and Messenger off my phone because I don't need it. Like, if I'm, if I'm being real, I don't need it on my phone. Um, if anyone wants to contact me, message me, ring me. Uh, and if I do need to look at something on Facebook, I'll do it on my computer because I'm, I know me, I'm less likely to spend time um, going too crazy on the computer. So I, I fall prey to the phone, which I'm trying to deal with right now, uh, which surprisingly, since I've been doing it, it's no, it's not hard at all for me. Like, it's out of the room. Don't even think about it. Uh, Netflix every now and then, that's that's definitely a, a big unnecessary time consumer. Uh and it's the same sort of thing on there. So you, you justify it to yourself. I, f- I find that's the biggest problem with something you're addicted to or a bad habit. You always find yourself justifying a reason uh, to want to do it. And you, your justifications can be absolutely bizarre. Like, you know, oh, but, you know, I can do it because, you know, I was good for five weeks. So it's like, 
doesn't mean you. It's like, for example, let's say let's say you got uh, a heroin addict. Well, if they've come off clean for six weeks, you don't reward yourself by having another, you know, dose of heroin. Mm. That'll just be stupid. You're just going to put yourself further back into it. But I think people tend to think of, you know, for example, the phone. Let's use the phone or Netflix. They don't think of these addictions as doing as much harm as heroin. I would agree. They're not doing as much harm. But just because they aren't doing that level of harm doesn't mean you can reward yourself by going back to what you're addicted to. If that makes sense as well. So... Again, I'm prey to it, but you know, the more I learn about it, and the, you know, the more I surround myself with things that uh, remind myself of these things, it just keeps you on the right path that little bit easier. And one of the biggest things I have found to help is scheduling, or not necessarily scheduling, but you know, sometimes scheduling or reminding myself of good ways to release dopamine and good methods to you know, you know, use your time with. So, for example. I would, how did I do it initially? So this was when I went through the slum. When I got out of it, my first thing was like, right, I want to keep myself busy until, what was it? Because I, was, I wasn't too bad. Like for me, it's like my level of slump is still, it's still a slump to me. Um, but I wasn't, you know, just lying on the couch all day. Uh, so I was like, all right, I want to stay busy doing decently productive things. You know, I wanted to get my training in. I want to read. I want to go for a walk and all that stuff. Um, but I want to make sure I'm filling up my day until about at least three, four o'clock. Um, and again, this was when, you know, full lockdown and everything, at least four o'clock before I laze about and, you know, do, you know, be lazy and watch Netflix or something like that. So that was the first step. And now I've sort of got it that little, uh, bit further, uh, you know, with work filling up and everything, I may have a day here or there where I don't have much to do during the day. Um, all the rest of the days are busy and this day's off. And I still even try and fill these off days, even though technically it's my break, I can do whatever, you know, whatever I want. I still try to fill those days up all the way up until, um, you know, fairly late at night. So something as simple as, like, I've tried to uh, write down all the things that I want to do. Uh, and I write them in my, in my, I use Google Calendar. Same. So as I put all my scheduling stuff on Google Calendar, but for example, habits that I want to change, something that I found that helped is, I just put like a, you know, it, uh, you can make it um, repeats every week or however frequent you want. I put the things that I want to change uh, like at the top of my calendar. So like, for example, 4 a.m. So like I'm not doing anything at 4 a.m. anyway. So I just put all those things that I want to change at the top there. So I'm constantly reminding myself of it because, for example, you know, I've got a couple of, you know, post-it notes with notes on them, but they don't give me the same reminder as the calendar does because I need to look at my calendar, you know, frequently to make sure I'm on track with, you know, clients and everything. And I found that helps a lot. So on one of them, on one of them, I've got a list of all of the, all the positive releasing dopamine activities that I enjoy. So for example, it's not like I do it every day, but I try and fill it up as much as I can. So if I finish work early, I've got a few things that I can do. Like I like to go rock climbing every now and then. Um, I like go karting. Uh, beach volleyball so just all these things it's like you know it's not necessarily productive but you know I'm getting out there I'm socializing I'm hanging out with my mates I'm doing something as opposed to sitting on my sitting on my ass and you know watching Netflix all night so yeah it's just the, a better way of doing things I think. that's interesting especially the I never thought about that to to put the habit or the reminder at the top of the calendar in the top of the white space that's that's a really interesting um, cue for the behavior because I got post notes too but you're right even if it's below my screen I don't look at it as much compared to exactly when my eyes are fixed yeah that yeah. is and it's just one method so everyone is going to have a method that they prefer better like sure you know, there's probably some people who are going to like the post-it notes better um I don't know if you saw my side of my room there I've got like five sheets with uh you know habits and affirmations and goals and etc so I see them every morning too um but yeah, like I've also got, you know, that same, the same morning routine and daily checklist that I've got, I've got that on my fridge as well, but everyone's got their thing. So another, it may have been in Atomic Habits, I can't remember off the top of my head, but a really easy reminder to not want to, for example, your habit is eating junk food or maybe just eating excess food, like too much food. An example of what you could do is to put a reminder, uh, this would be breaking the bad habit, making it unattractive from memory if I'm getting it right. So putting like a photo of what you want to look like or if you looked you know, in good shape 10 years ago and you got a photo of it, put it on your fridge, put it on your pantry, remind yourself every time you go to eat that bad food, you're just like, shouldn't do it, you know, that's my goal. Or it could just be a reminder of the weight you want to hit or the weight you currently are or just 
it could work in any way. It could be like a how you want to look or how you don't want to look or how you want to, um, how much you want to weigh or how much you don't want to weigh. So there's, it's just, everyone's going to find their personal preference. But the good thing is there's so many different avenues on how you can remind yourself and give you those triggers. Another good example could be something as simple as, uh, I, I, for example, have it at 4 a.m. Someone else could put something, if their habit is a time-related thing, they could put uh, book in a weekly reminder or a daily reminder even to remind them not to do that habit mm. or just to remind them that they're prone to do something bad at that time. So, you know, they'll get that, that's a positive uh, notification they'll get on their phone. Like that's, this is where, you know, technology is a good thing. Um, like for example, three o'clock I'm at the office, I normally go and get a Coke out of the vending machine. And I can program into my Google Calendar, well, 2.50 or 2.55, um, don't get the Coke dear water. And it's like sometimes people don't realize they're, what they're doing. So it's a, lot of, a lot of the time it's unconscious, not, not all the time, um, but sometimes it is unconscious. Like they're not consciously trying to do a bad habit. It's just they do it because it's just, it's habit. And I'm guilty of that with the phone. Like I'm not constantly saying, hey, let's go on my phone. It's like it's there and I'll just grab the freaking thing uh, and then go from there. So yeah, this, the good thing is we have a lot of methods. It's just people need to have that base knowledge of how it all works, mm. how habits work, what can I do about it, what are the systems, and then just choose what works best for them. And a book like Atomic Habits is a really great foundation to learn that. Um, but I wonder, and this is something I've really been thinking about lately over, the, over this year, is how do high performers high-performing individuals, A-type personalities, people who have a big hunger and drive for excellence and success and prosperity, how do they interact and balance experiencing joy and gluttony even in their life? For example, when do you know, Andrew, when is the right time that you can purposefully indulge or purposefully engage in quote-unquote stereotypical things that society may deem as unproductive and unresourceful but for you they fill you up in a different way whether it's enjoying uh, a nice uber eats meal or a restaurant meal or a pizza or a donut or whether it's actually watching something that you want to watch how do you balance the guilt that sometimes we can feel versus no this is actually something i've planned and i want to do and i will do it and i will fully enjoy it so I find the biggest thing that helps with that is the bullet journal that I showed you before. The difference is the difference with the method you use with the jar, which again, if, if you've got a single habit, it'll be great. The only difference with the jar and what I'm doing is because I've got multiple things here um, and you know the easier thing to look at is a different color correlates with each habit that I want to do. Uh, but for example, if I say, um, where am I here? So I've got one of them sticking to calories um, because, you know, I'm the type where if I don't have something that I'm going for, so currently I don't have any specific goal. I'm not getting ready for a comp or anything. So every now and then I cave in, in just to not hitting my calories, going a little bit over. So if I find, for example, I've been hitting my calories for a long time, let's say I've got the whole month, I might be like, all right, sweet, I can have like a cheat meal tonight, something like that. Uh, in saying that, the biggest thing that I'm doing with indulging at the moment because if you, I'm sure you would have seen some of Dave's protocol, like a lot of them are easy and mm. they're pretty restrictive. Yeah. So, you know, traditional breakfast, for example, like, you know, I'm having slow cooked meats just about every day. So you, I haven't had traditional breakfast for ages. Uh, and then my lunch, I always have like a weird lunch. So Dave's a big, big uh, advocate of organ meats. Um, and I pretty much every lunch I'm having organ meats. Not that I want to have it for the taste. Like there's some that don't taste too bad, but most of them, you know, not too crash hot. Uh, so I'm having like two meals a day already where, you know, I don't even, I'd, I'd much prefer to have something else for taste if I wanted to, but because I know how much it's helping with health, I'll stick to it. Same thing with my dinner. My dinner's nothing special as well. I'm just getting the job done. So I pretty much have, uh, I allow myself to have two not going off the walls, cheap meals, uh, per week. So I line it up where every day I have three, three meals that I've prepped. Uh, but on Saturday, Sunday, I only have two. So I allow myself that extra meal on Saturday and Sunday to be whatever I want. But in general, I am sticking to it pretty good. So, you know, for example, Nando's, like just chicken. Right. And I'm not looking at all the bread and all that stuff. 
uh, and then grilled, I might get like a gluten-free burger. So like at the end of the day, I'm still pretty much sticking to what Dave wants, uh, but it's you know just that little bit nicer. Like everything's put together much nicer. And then say if we're talking about Netflix or Facebook or video games or something like that, um, I just try and program it in. So I've gone through multiple phases where you know one phase would be you know like the example of being made redundant and COVID happening. You know just being lazy 24/7 not good and i didn't want to stay like that you know pick myself up after a week or two and then i've gone through the other phase where it's just like you know 24 7 is work 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 no time to myself and then um you know you just end up burning yourself out so even though i know if i was to stay in that mode like 24 7 like you know a highly motivated person you know high level ceo how they are i know that long term i'm not going to be happy um, i'm going to end up resenting what i'm doing yeah and yeah, and just not having that balance. So for me, I just sort of made a decision where I'm like, look, I want balance at this point. I don't think I want to put, I don't want to give everything all of my time. I want to, you know, give this thing a little bit of time, give that a little bit of time, give that a little bit of time. So on average, when you look at my how my week set up, unless I've got something on uh, for the night, which I, I frequently do, like every, you know, normally two or three nights a week on average, roughly, um, when I'm doing something, you know, I might be socializing or whatever it may be. But if I'm not doing that, I allow a certain amount of time every night to sort of just whatever you want to do, just chill, just watch But here's the, the thing, that's a, that's a purposeful choice, right? It's not a result of a reactionary, like, uh, it's not a reaction from your environment cueing you. It's like, oh, I fall into a bad habit. No, it's a choice. Andrew is going to spend this amount of time doing this enjoyable activity. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It helps so much like that as well. Um, it, it just because you, you're, I remember it was so Jordan Peterson, uh, I went through a phase where I was, I was obsessed with all this stuff just because of how he just puts a lot of, 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 you know, the problems that we face day to day, he just puts it into perspective in a unique way and it just helps so much. So what I got from him was, you know, he was talking about someone that was trying to, you know, move forward in life, uh, and you know, what would be the best step to move forward and how would you go about it? Uh, and the example from memory that he used was someone that was extremely messy, like an extremely messy room, something along the lines of that. And he, same sort of thing as Atomic Habits, he's like, start small. So the example was in this person, uh, their room, it was just like an absolute mess. And he goes, all right, let's just create a little circle. He goes, I want you to make, you know, this much of your room clean. So a little part on your desk, I want that to be clean. I said, like, all right, well then, you know, start from there and build up from there. And eventually over time, your whole uh, room would be clean. So the other thing that he said that stuck with me was schedule the day you want. Mm. So something as simple as if, let's say we're looking at today, so it's like, you know, I may have training, I may have you know, morning routine, I might do training, have a couple of clients, uh, do some errands, and then at night I wanted to uh, relax. And for me, that might be the perfect day for me. So I might not be doing absolutely everything I could from a business standpoint, but at this current point in time, I'm doing, I'm enjoying my day. So I'm enjoying my life in every way that I could be. So I'm still doing, you know, the leisure things that I want to do without burning myself out for the things that I need to do. And ever since I found myself doing that, I don't resent doing the things I need to do. Nice. And I'm more likely to do it. I'm more likely to stick to it. And I'm even more likely to do a bit extra of it as well. Right. well that's, I think that's such a powerful position to get in. You know, it makes me think while you're talking, like you found that cadence, that rhythm that works for you. I wonder, you know, expectations from society, expectations and pressures that we put on ourselves from other people. You know, I think we live in this society now where weakness is often, well, it depends how you frame it, but not working hard and not being productive in a lot of worlds is, is looked down upon. Right? If you're not working every minute of every hour of every second, Gary Vaynerchucking your life, god damn it. You you ain't doing enough. You ain't David Gogginsing every hour. What are you doing? Right? Obviously these people actually don't live like that. David stretches for over an hour every day. Um, Gary has uh, weeks and weeks of vacation and family time that he partitions out. Like these people don't literally live like this. But that's the perception a lot of the times. I know I've been there where I've been like, shit, 
I've fallen into the idea that I that to be this idea of successful or to to be effective and productive in life, I have to keep going every moment. And I wonder if I or you couldn't tell anybody about anything we were doing, like no one knew, would we still do it? It's an, it's a very interesting question. So I, I guess this ties into, you know, are you self-motivated or are you motivated by like um, external circumstances yes. as well? So it's sort of, have you, have you read The Power of Now by any chance? It's Eckhart Tolle? Yeah. I haven't. Yeah, it's highly recommended, okay. highly recommended. Okay. So this is a lot of, in a way, it's what he touches on. Uh, and he, he just explains how a lot of people who have anxiety, depression, or, you know, stress and all of that, it comes from where their mind currently is. And what I mean by that is what they're focusing on. Yeah. And I'm sure you, you probably know yourself from experience, or you probably know people that are, um, are like this, where their whole paradigm is of life is I need to reach this goal and then I'll be happy. Yeah. And I need to, you know, accomplish something and then I can relax. Whereas what he's basically saying in uh, the power of now is you need to learn to be happy with what you have right this second, right mm. now. Um, you know, whatever happened, you know, a year ago, you know, you can't let that dwell on you because that's going to, you know, make you feel sort of regretful. Or I wanted to change something in the past. And if I'm constantly living in the future, then I'm always anxious of what's to come. Whereas opposed to if I focus on what's happening right now in this moment, I'm going to be at peace. So if you're the type, or let's say we've got someone that's an executive that's you know very high up and working 24-7, um, not to say that's a, a bad thing. You know, It's good that they're trying to hit goals, but there's no balance there. Um, and in general, people like that are always, there's a forward-focused goal. So there's something that's happening in the future. So their, their frame of mind is always what's happening, what's happening next, what's happening next, what am I doing? So they, that's another reason as to why they're being stressed as opposed to a bunch of other factors. And this is one of the reasons why, I, I actually said something similar to this when I was very young, like a, along the lines of, I would rather do something I love and earn less money than something I absolutely dread for the rest of my life and earn, you know, four times the amount. So, you know, I, I, would, you would, I, I can't see how you would be happy in that situation where you're spending you know, average person works eight hours a day. You're spending eight hours a day, five days a week doing something you hate. But how are you supposed to be happy? Um, so, you know, in saying that, you can always find that. You can always find happiness with what's going on right now. But ideally, you'd want to sort of transition out to something that you that you do love as well. Um, and another good, if we relate this back to a cue of how to remind yourself to be present um, and, you know, appreciate what you have in this present moment, after I read that book, I was sort of at a cross, like, I don't have any tattoos, but I was, at a, I, was, I was considering getting one after that because I wanted something to remind me to, to stay present. And I'm like, look, I think a tattoo is a bit too much for something like that. Um, so I ended up getting it's this thing. So it's just called a mantra band. Okay. Uh, it's, got, it's just got live in the moment on there. So that's my cue to remind myself every now and then. But it is, it's actually very, it's very interesting because it's, ne it's never been something that I've focused on until I read the book. And it's true. Just... So many times in the day, you, f you find yourself, my, m my mind is on something that's occurring in the future or something that's happened in the past. Sure. Very rarely, the only time that we tend to find ourselves focusing on what's happening right now is, you know, adrenaline producing activities, they, they, they help a lot. So, for example, driving fast cars or, you know, going doing martial arts training, you find, you know, you're always focused on what's happening right now. And this is where a lot of people can become adrenaline junkies because, Living in the moment is like true peace. You're like, you're actually enjoying your life. You're happy. Mm. So this is where a lot of people unknowingly get addicted to that. You know, it's good that they're in the moment, but they may be doing that with activities that might not be, you know, optimal. So, you know, for example, drug use could be another example where, you know, the drugs make them focus on the moment and they enjoy it, but now they're an addict. So it's like there's downside. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely been a really good thing to learn how to focus and appreciate what's happening right now. And I find with your you know, working too much, it's definitely going to play its toll on you because I'm sure you know as well, uh, learning from Dave, if you're working too much, stress and all that is all, you know, taken over, then you're going to have gut problems. So it's like, you know, you may be doing the right thing in your mind, but eventually, you know, you're starting, you're, get, you're actually damaging your own health by going too, you know, too hard, constantly going to have that fight or flight response is, you know, a massive 
excess of um, you know adrenaline and all those other hormones, and then bit by bit it's just trickling down and causing you problems in the long run. So you're you're actually even though you may be thinking I'm spending all this time, I'm doing the right thing. Like how many? I'm sure you would have heard. I've, I've seen it so many times. You have this high level executive, very accomplished in life, uh, and their health is an absolute mess, and they're not happy. So it's like, well, what was the point of it? Or you you just worked to accumulate a bunch of possessions. And you're not even in the right, you know, place in, of mind to enjoy yourself right now. So, mm. what, what was the point? That's that's a really good point. And it's almost like if you could practice being present and enjoying, enjoying less, owning less, having less, and practicing that skill, then perhaps when you gain more, you will be much better prepared to appreciate, show gratitude to it. And be present with it. Definitely, definitely. There's um another book, uh, yeah. A Man's Search for Meaning. Yeah, Victor uh, Frankel. I got it. Yeah. So, yeah, how he how he's basically saying in that like if you can find happiness, you know, in in a situation as extreme as that, yeah. Well, that's showing you, you know, that's that's learning how to appreciate everything that you have. Uh, and as a society, we're spoiled. We're very very spoiled. Um, you know, myself included. But something as simple as doing that gratitude journaling just centers you every day and reminds of all the good that you have in your life yeah. as opposed to, unfortunately, we as, we as uh, people tend to always focus on the negative that's in our life. And we never go out of our way to think about the positive stuff that we have. Um, and I know this very well. Like I was a very spoiled child. I was, I was the only child, so I was very spoiled. Uh, and I never stopped to appreciate like you know all the good that I have in my life. And ever since, just looking back on everything, I'm like, man, I've, you know, for example, the injuries and stuff I've had. If that's like, I oh, don't get me wrong, I've had my other ups and downs and everything. But if, if that's like one of the only major things that have affected my life, then I'm very, very, very fortunate for what for I have. Sure. Um, you know, I might not be, you know, driving freaking Lamborghinis and Ferraris and doing all this crazy, crazy stuff. But at the end of the day, that balance is more important to me. So I'd rather enjoy my life right now in every possible aspect as opposed to devoting myself crazily in one area and then everything else drops off and i think balance is one of the most important things that we could focus on and i think it's just like you got to do what you want to do like for you andrew that's important to you like you need to do that to satiate yourself in your pursuit in this life for other people like like let's say what is what's an let's give some examples of something where you solely focus on one thing professional sport you know when i used to play basketball for about five six years it was the ultimate mission in my life was take this sport as far as possible, right? I was solely dedicated and obsessed with that. That mentality, while obsession and curiosity is a big part of my how I express myself in today, to d today, but it's throughout a variety of different modalities, and it's not just about one thing. It's about finding... Um, I guess our own meaning. It's like, what's the meaning of life? I think the I think it's like to find your own meaning is a part of that answer, and people try and well, not try, but they get influenced by others, and they and they they, they live lives um, that aren't of their own accord and aren't of their own making, truly. And it's just a deep kind of reflective question they have to ask: Are you really doing what you want to do? Am I doing really what I want to do? Right, because maybe I do want to climb the mountain, and I want to pursue this one task as far as I can take it. And you go for it. You should do that. But but make sure it's something you actually desire from you, rather than someone else's life or dream. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And that's it. Sort of ties back to uh, what Dr. Jordan Peter, Jordan uh, Peterson was saying with make the day you want it's just on like a larger scale because sure. it will create the life you want yes so yes. you know in in every aspect so for example like let's say the basketball thing again not to say it's a bad thing if you if, if someone took that all the way to the top and they you know became one of the best in the world that's awesome but if it's at the expense of your happiness i think a lot of people need to look at that like is it really worth it like you know you might have there's so many examples where you know people have fame this that and everything so much money and they're depressed they hate their life so it's like, well, when you look at, you know, the reasons as to why, well, look, that's that's a big reason. You just look at what does their life consist of. They're not doing anything that fulfills them. They're just doing it, you know, because they, their prior pursuit was money and fame. 
just for the sake of money and fame. Um, so yeah, it's it's yeah, it's just a battle that people people have to realize what do they want and how can I go about it and how can I have the life that I want in every area, like take into account everything. And again, if someone really wants that and that's all they want and they're happy by, you know, becoming the best basketball in the world, more power to you. Mm. If they know that they can get there without becoming sad, great. That's the path that you've chosen. But this is this is like when you ask me about uh, the MMA thing. So my, the way I've got my schedule set up at the moment, I can train, uh, I can do MMA twice a day. So I can do weights. So it'll be like three three times a day training. So I can do weights and MMA twice a day. But then I was asking myself, I'm like, think about balance. Like, do you really want to go down that that um, that route? And you know, I might I might have done you know I might have my experience in it, and I may, I might have the talent for it even. But if I look at my days and what my life's going to look like, I'm like I don't know if I want to spend that much time doing one activity. So the, the, how can I say, the part that I've sort of come to in getting that balance, so feeling happy with my, my day, my schedule, my life again, was the middle ground was basically saying, all right, I'll do one day, once a day minimum. I'm like, I'm happy with that because I can still do everything else I need to do. Yeah. But that second session is going to be, a negotiable. So, for example, if I wanted to go rock climbing, I'll axe that second session of martial arts. If I didn't go rock climbing and I'm, I'm not socializing that day and I've got nothing else to do that night, then I'll go martial arts. It. So it's like I'm filling it up. I'm do, I'm basically got the schedule that I want. Um, and looking forward, you know, even though I may not, let's just say I pursued it all the way and you know, made it to the UFC or something like that, I may not have got there, but I didn't sacrifice my happiness just for the sake of getting there. Right, you did it on your own terms, but yeah. the, the, I don't know the word happiness has come up many times, and you know it. It's an interesting word, it's something a lot of people I think try and chase and attain, and um, I've really changed my tune on the idea of happiness. But I wonder for those a lot of those high performers, a lot of people, even me, like I don't know if happiness is really the word. But for some people it is. Like for you, Andrew, maybe. Right? But I don't know. Like Michael Jordan. Like when I was playing basketball, I'm like, I just I put my same name in the sentence as Michael Jordan. Let me just distance those two for a second. Okay? Because we're very far apart. Okay. Myself, when I was playing, I didn't, I wasn't happy. I wasn't. No, I have to really reflect back on it. I wasn't. Like I experienced maybe fleeting moments of uh, fulfillment. Oh, I definitely experienced fulfillment and meaning. And a sense of accomplishment, but happiness, eh, it was a grind. It was fighting an uphill battle for years. And I think guys in the highest, guys and girls at the highest level, like the Michael Jordans and Kobe Bryant's of the world, like from what I see observing them and studying them, I don't think and I don't see happiness being at the forefront or even close to the forefront of their mind. I think there's other things that. Uh, occupy them. Do you do you see that, or am I missing something? No, you're definitely right. And since you brought it up, I I was wrong. So happiness wasn't the right word. I think I meant to say like joy or at right. Peace. Okay. So yeah, like happiness, you you can't be happy twenty four seven, um, but you can be like at peace and you know appreciate everything that you have. Okay. And be yeah. There at the sure. time. Um, so yeah, but ex exactly like what you're saying, like you you don't no one's happy 24/7. So like that example where say you know Michael Jordan or whatever, he, he's not happy all the time. You don't see him happy all the time. In saying that, like you know we're not in his shoes. He may be at peace with everything that's happening, and like he may be appreciating everything that he has, and he might be on the path that he wants to be. Like we don't know that. Like you know we're not in his mind. Um, but the thing is. It's wanting to have exactly what you want in your life. That, like, I feel like that should be a lot of people's pursuit. Mm. If we're talking about someone at an extremely high level, obviously they're going to have more extreme goals. But your average person, if they could just live, or well, you know, start off with your day. What do you want your day to look like? Mm. And then go from there, and then progress that to your week, and then progress that to a year, and etc. Um, but yeah, happiness. We're definitely not going to be happy twenty four seven. Uh, but yeah, joy. I think joy should be the goal. Just joy, at peace, and you know, present with everything. So that that word, that is the word that I've been using previously over the uh, last couple of years. I listened to a Tim Ferriss podcast, and then 
you know, this um, woman, I can't remember her name, she asked the question, does the items you ask, the items you own, the clothes, the things, the this, the that, do they bring you joy? And I think about it, I'm like, huh. We, we own so many things that really don't serve us, but they're just an accumulation of things, of overconsumption. And that word joy and peace and fulfillment and meaning and contentment, like those, I think those are the words that I believe accurately portray sustainable states that a human being can effectively live by. Definitely, definitely. So I was just thinking of it as you said it. So let's say, you know, material possessions. Like, you know, this, I got a you know, big monitor, doesn't bring me any happiness. I got, you know, a nice TV, you know, a nice place and everything. You know, it's nice, but that's not the reason why I'm at joy with myself or, you know, at peace with myself. Another example would be, uh, for example, my car. So I've got a fairly fast car, I like my fast cars. And driving it does put a smile on my face. So it's like that little bit of extra happiness. But when we look at the reason as to what, uh, Eckhart Tolle was saying about, you know, past, present, future. I feel like it's just that adrenaline rush that I'm looking forward to that's mm. allowing me to get to peace as opposed to just being at peace, you know, for its own sake. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's just an interesting way of looking at it. But it's, it's 100% true. I've had a, a few DMs with an old friend on a similar topic where, it was, but yeah, basically the similar topic where I, I would sort of argue you know, if, if we go into, for example, religion and God and everything, my argument was, how can two people be tested so different, yet both would be allowed to go into heaven for, you know, if they obeyed the Ten Commandments, for example. Um, like, the example was, I used two extremes, like you say, we've got someone that's had, you know, uh, test after test and just troubles their whole life and just absolute suffering, just an absolutely very difficult life, as opposed to someone that was born into riches, uh, had a very easy, cruisy life that still, you know, obeyed the Ten Commandments. And it's like, well, how how do you justify that? Like, how can they both be allowed into heaven if one had, had it so easy and one had it so hard? And it was a question I struggled with for a long time when I was younger. Um, and what she said to me was very interesting. She was basically saying, so she had been in, uh, she's Philippine background, and she went to holidays uh, many times to the Philippines. And she found that a lot of the starving and homeless people on the street were some of the happiest and joyous people that she's ever met in her life. Uh, and the reason being is they're just grateful for what they have. And if you see some homeless people in uh, like South Asia, they're, they're like, they have deformities. Like it's so like they're missing a leg. They're on the side of the road. They're absolutely you know broke. They're starving. Everything. And to see people like that being like having peace is just insane whereas you find people that are caught up in the material possessions uh, don't even appreciate what they have like you got spoiled little brats with you know dad's money a big company they got lamborghinis ferraris and you know all this money partying up at you know clubs and everything and they're, and they're not even happy and it's just what well, it makes you think well what is all this possession for like it, clearly it doesn't make you any happier like what's the point uh and then you relate that back to Eckhart Tolle and it's like well yeah it's you, you've got to learn to appreciate what you have right now as opposed to always focusing on that next thing and i think a big part of the reasons why a lot of uh you know extremely rich people or famous people might struggle is because they have the potential to have so many things and it's like almost like they're they're addicted to the next thing that they're going to buy or the next thing that get, they're going to get so they're always chasing that high and they're never actually happy with what they have it's such a big important topic that you're mentioning um, I'm just trying to reflect upon it. it. It reminds me of just how disconnected we've become. Like, if we really think about, like, the modern lifestyle of Western Western civilization, like, go back. Mm, the agricultural revolution occurred about 12,000 years ago. I don't know if you've read Sapiens, where the advent of wheat really changed the way we interface and we, um, we migrated and we collated in groups and that was a huge shift. And then this other shift is this technological shift we've seen in the last, you know, through the Industrial Revolution, through the last uh, few hundred years. And it's not a lot of time. It's like two, three people, right? We've seen this huge change. And especially in the last hundred years, 
We've seen this dramatic, but we're the same. Like, biologically, genetically, uh, we're pretty much the same. Like, we haven't evolved much at all over the last, you know, thousands of years. Yet, we have all these huge advancements to adjust and adapt to. And it's like, huh, I wonder how much of that is the source of so much of the misery and uh, involuntary suffering that people go through. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So, uh, you just remind me of a lot of the points they talk about in uh, The Social Dilemma. Ah, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much, I don't need to watch anymore. I just brought them all up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. So, so uh, how are they sort of explaining it? So, and exactly, if we relate it back to something simple that a lot of people would understand, uh, just like foods that a lot of people wouldn't even think twice about. So if we, let's say we, we time travel back in time 5,000 years ago, you know, we've got cavemen or whatever you want to call them. Mm. Uh, in those days, we don't find, so the three the three things that our brains go, you know, ape shit, if you want to call it that, for um, sugar, fats, and salt. So, you know, in nature, back in those days, you're not really going to find all three together. It's like, you know, you might find, some sugar cane or you might find some fruit that has sugar or something along the lines of yeah, that. Yeah, the animal has the fat and the protein. Yeah, it's interesting, yeah. Yeah. Um, which is funny because when you look at how big companies make money, obviously, so let's say we're a, we're a sweets company or let's say a chocolate com- company and I'm the CEO. If my only uh, concern in life is money, well, then I'm going to try and make money off people in any way I can. And, and what would be a very, very good idea to do? Well, if these three things make people go ape shit, why don't we combine them in one mm. and make them go triple ape shit? Because it's like synergistic. Um, and then you think about, well, what's in the junk food we eat? Sugar, fat, salt. Mm. Have a Mars bar, sugar, fat, salt. Have some chips, sugar, fat, How salt. How about those macadamia nuts that are coated, right, in chocolate or something, and yeah. salt on the top? That'll, come on, man. <laughs> it's cheating. That'll, it's fuck cheating. You, that'll fuck your life up. So it's it's interesting how yeah it, it is true. So we are not designed for what's happening right now. We are not designed to resist those chocolate bars. We're not designed for that because we never had to deal with that stuff five thousand years ago. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and then you say if we relate that to technology, well, it's the same thing. If we look at the biggest releases of dopamine in nature, so let's say there's no technology. So what do we have? You you know you could you could still be get a dopamine hit from your career or your life or, you know, whatever you do. So work-related. So you still can get dopamine from that. Um, we've got sex, we've got food, um, and they're, they're pretty much like your main ones. Like there's going to be a few more, but they're, they're going to be your biggest releases of everything. If we look at, so let's look at your biggest release of dopamine that we have. So it's going to be sex. Let's just say for the sake of this argument that sex releases 10 dopamine, you know, work-related releases 8 and food releases 5, something along the lines of that. If we look at what we have access to uh, in compared to uh, sex these days, well, the part of our brain that releases dopamine doesn't care if there's a naked female in front of me or if there's a naked female on the screen. It's still the same dopamine, which is an issue because it's the same thing as uh, gambling. I can look up a new uh, a new girl every two seconds with porn if I wanted to. So as opposed to nature, me having a, a relationship, a wife, a girlfriend, whatever it may be, and she gives me 10 dopamine, well, my receptors are made to handle 10 dopamine and it's normal. We're all good. Everything works as it should. As opposed to if I click a button and I can release, you know, if I just keep clicking, I can release 200 dopamine within 10 minutes if I wanted to, right? Anyone could. It's just so easily accessible these days. Now, if I've released 200 dopamine, these receptors become numb. Mm. Now, all of a sudden, to feel the same effect that 10 dopamine did give me, I now need 200 dopamine. And this is where relationship problems come from uh, porn. So if, I, if I'm expecting 200 dopamine and my partner's only giving me 10, well, I'm, not, I'm never going to be satisfied. And this same principle applies for basically everything else. If I'm constantly on Facebook all day scrolling and constantly releasing dopamine, well, then all the things in life that should fulfill me and should make me satisfied with what I'm doing are never going to give me the same release of those neurochemicals. So, it's yeah, we, we are not evolved for what we have these days. And what we have these days is basically designed to keep us hooked. Like they designed video games to keep us hooked. So that, you know, the more fun we have on a video game, the more likely we are to keep playing it again. 
and the more likely people are to buy that video game. So they make them as addictive as possible, as messed up as that does sound. I think, um, yeah, it's, it's, that's the problem, right? But I think we can all get to the point where we can become the masters of our own domain, right? And we can govern the reality and we decide. And so I think, like for myself, like some of the things you've been doing actually is is deleting apps and and changing notifications, which I think are game change, game changing behavior changes that you can do to manage that. Um, but I think what the special thing is that underlines this whole conversation is, you know, we talked about you know foods and chemicals that can be harmful for health um, and habits and this addiction, that habit and this habit. Well, what if we could get to a point? where we could design and make our bodies so robust and resilient again, and still being able to interface with those things. For example, people uh, like like Dave says, like gluten, th- the problem really isn't so much with the gluten molecule, the two protein gluten molecules that are comprising gluten, okay? It's, well, okay, how did the all the processing and, change in our, and the way we process and grow and harvest wheat change and dramatically upregulate the amount of actual gluten proteins, gliden and glutenin in this molecule. Okay, interesting. And we go to Italy and Sardinia and we don't see those those uh, reactions. Well, okay, that's interesting. So maybe, and then let's apply that now to, I don't know, anything. It's like, well, is the problem really with the individual food or the individual object? Or what if we could come to a place where, you know, I'm finding myself now where I can interface with foods and behaviors that people would maybe get easily addicted to, be able to interface with them, enjoy them, pay them respect, step out, and keep doing my thing 95% of the time, right? Like, what if we all got to that point? It'll be it'll be amazing. That'll be, you know, almost like a utopian vision of what we have right now. Like, it'll be an optimized version of society. Right. Um, the problem is how do we get there and how can we get around the companies purposefully making their products you know as hard as possible to deal with um you know ideally we could have some regulations and stuff like that the problem would be for example if we've got certain uh things that we deal with on a day-to-day basis that are made to make us addicted to it so again example food facebook netflix whatever it is how can we get to that point when they're designed to make us addicted? So the, in my eyes, the best thing would be we have to educate people. So that would be the biggest first step. Um, funnily enough, it's not always good enough. So, for example, the, the gut health stuff that we talk about with Dave. Hmm. Unfortunately, in, in our society, it's not mainstream, first of all. So if you do bring it up to your average person, not everyone is going to be on board from the get-go. So you're going to have a lot of people that are very resistant. You're like, well, that's not what the doctors say. They said, if I take this medication, it's going to be better. Um, so then it's like, well, how do you cross that barrier? Uh, and then let's say we talk about, let's say Netflix. How can you get someone that's hooked on Netflix to get off Netflix? So it's like the saying, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make them drink. Exactly. Like you can tell them as much as what you want, but ideally we need to get them wanting to do it. I don't really have an answer. My closest answer is education, but at the same time, you can control the education you want. Like I was saying before with me in school, if I don't find it interesting, I'm not going to pay attention to it. So ideally, it'd, be, it'd have to be some government initiative or something where it's like an official thing. We're trying to get people to stop these addictions or something along the lines of that. Then you come into another conversation which might be uh, a little bit a little bit out there, if you want to call it that. So... At that level, when there's that much money at play, is there is there corruption? Is there you know are there politicians taking bribes for, for certain sure. things like yeah? So 100%. then we cross like how do we cross that barrier? So if there's if there's corruption in government, how do we get past that? Like how can we, for example, let's say let's say Facebook, they they're a billion dollar company. How do we cross that barrier where we try and get politicians or government to place a limit on what they have and which would in effect make them earn less money when someone in that position could just simply bribe the politicians to say, well, we're not going to do it. Just take this money and, and forget about it. Like it's, it's a, a very complex issue that we need to deal with. And so I, I feel like we, I'd love for it to all happen, but 
where do where do you start when there's so many different yeah. avenues to, to attack? It, it can be super overwhelming and like because you know I'm one person, you're one person, we have a sphere of influence, you know. But okay, so what can we do? Well, I think it's a, it's a there's no one answer. It's a multifaceted, multi-layered, um, highly complex, multivariate approach and problem. However, I believe in putting autonomy and power to the individual. And so I think that old adage of be the change you want to see in the world, I think that speaks true. And I look at you, Andrew, and the the and look at guys like Dave O'Brien and look at like my coach Ben, like there's there's a, there's people who are embodying excellence and health and really like Jordan Peterson, really strong, um, thoughtful ideas, and those people are inspiring. And I think if we can by being the change that we want to see, I mean, maybe we don't have to. That's how we can lead the horse to the water and make it drink. Because, wow, people look at you as a symbol of excellence. And maybe some of those people, through looking at you, realize they're inadequate, which is a very tough and honest thing to assess within yourself. And they go, hey, uh, I'm gonna, they get to the point they have to do something about it. Because you have been excellent they have been forced to reflect on their own inadequacy and that has brought them to the table where they can improve themselves and then one person at a time one sphere of influence at a time i believe that's how our whole society can change yeah that's great that's awesome so yeah it's it's pretty much that what would be great would be as many people in positions like us, so like, you know, coaches or trainers or whatever it may be, to use their knowledge um, and learn more to help other people. So the equivalent example would be, let's say your average personal trainer compared to, you know, someone at, um, you know, me, you, Dave's level with, you know, different scopes of practice, you know, gut health, as opposed to just, you know, training and eat healthy. Sure. Um, So you're going to make so much more improvements and having that knowledge of, you know, how habits work uh, and all the different avenues that you can attack. So it would be good if we could have something where we could uh, teach as many other trainers to get out there. So there's only so many people I can coach. There's only so many people you can coach. There's only so many people Dave can coach. But if you coach coaches, well, then that just expands exponentially. So there's so many more people that you can impact. So a good way would be basically all the things you just said um, and trying to teach as many coaches about that to try and impact as many people as possible. And that's why I think podcasts are so powerful and why I, you know, I don't see myself ever stopping this, you know, as long as I'm able to, like talking to people and having open, honest conversations. And we can see now through society how many popular, influential humans that have podcasts now and how they can really shift ideas and inspire and influence a whole generation of people and it's very inspiring to me um, and it's it's one kind of shift that pushed me into doing this myself but you know just by having these open honest conversations and, and like you said also within our own professions speaking and mentoring and educating it's like one person at a time it's like that that's my that's my optimism to it but it shouldn't necessarily mm, not take it shouldn't take away from the responsibility that government and other organizations have to improve because that's where we should put pressure on them to lift their game yeah definitely and yeah podcasts are an amazing way to do it so you just reminded me of a good dopamine substitute so if you and I've, i've used this myself so when I found myself on Netflix too many times, mm. every now and then it's like, you know, I might watch a London Real episode or a Joe Rogan podcast or something. And I, like, when, if I'm being honest with myself, I enjoy a lot more podcasts than I do, you know, junk uh, media that I watch on, on Netflix. Uh, and you're, you're actually getting something out of it. Like you said, you're, having, you're listening to conversations of people at a certain level, you're learning new topics. Um, you just, it's, it's just better in every way that you can look at it. Like you are, you want to sit on the TV and, and relax, watch something half decent, then learn something while you're at it and you'll find you actually enjoy it. Like some, it sort of ties back to, uh, me with reading. So like it's a lot of, for a lot of people, it'll seem very boring, but 
if you're actually learning something, so a lot of the books I read are like self-help books. So if you're learning something, well, it's actually it's it's quite enjoyable. Like you're you're learning what you want to learn. You're you're you know gaining more knowledge on a certain topic or whatever. So same thing applies with the podcast. And like you said, you know you're reaching a lot more people than what you could if it was just me and you talking. You're only hitting one person here as opposed to all the people that are listening yes. to our conversation. Um, and then yeah, you're, you're just impacting a lot more people. So you're definitely right. Podcasts are absolutely amazing these days look man you're a good speaker and you got some stories maybe you should do one one day yourself have you thought about that no i never have um i might have to uh, maybe some of the concerns i know you're already not on social media much as it is so that might be that might take you the other direction but when you watch the social dilemma did you take away anything else from it like you mentioned some things but was there one main or couple takeaways to summarize it I think the biggest light bulb moment for me was when they explain how how the algorithms work, and it, it's actually it's actually quite scary. Um, so, for example, I, again, I didn't realize they went this into depth with it. Like, I knew I knew it was obviously very very advanced. I didn't realize it was this advanced. Like, you could you could basically call social media algorithms in a sense AI. Um, they know us extremely well. Uh, just how they explain it. So. What they're basically saying is, so let's say, let's say it's Facebook. If I'm on Facebook, they've got a measurement, a measurement tool that says how fast am I scrolling? Uh, how long did I look at this certain picture? Um, what search words have I typed in? So they know what's going to get me more addicted. To that. So for example, let's say I look at, I don't know, cars. So let's say I look at GDRs every now and then. So let's say I'm looking at a GDR. Facebook knows I'm looking at a GDR. So Pause. if I have Do you a, own a GDR? Because I love the Nissan, the Nissan GTR. I have had one in the past. Woo! What year was uh, it? Was it wait the old one, new one? The new one, so 2012. Oh goodness me! Um, so yeah, that that was ridiculous. So I, I definitely missed that car. So I can't put into words how extreme that car is. Really? I tried to. Um, every single person, every mate that I had that I took for a drive in it, I explained how it was as best as I could. And they got in their car and they freaked out. Like that thing is just next level. So I got that car. It had it had an acropovic exhaust on it and it had an ECU tech tune on it. I drove it out of the dealership. It was second hand when I got it. So I drove it out of the dealership super careful. Um, it was actually it's actually very hard to keep in the It's a very fat car. It's a very, yeah, very, very wide. Car. So it was very hard to keep in the lines. Uh, but once I got used to it, I'm like, all right, I'll give it a couple of hits and over the moon. I was having so much fun. Anyway, I woke up the next day and I'm like, I was thinking to myself, I'm like, ECU tech, I'm like, that's an adjustable tune. I'm like, it is, it is, I've heard of it before. Anyway, I looked it up, it's an adjustable tune. I'm like, I wonder what mine's set on. Anyway, I eventually figured out how to customize it and everything, got in the car. It was on the lowest setting possible. And I'm like, oh, man, turn that fucking thing up, I'm going to have some fun right now. So anyway, I turned it all the way up. It was, I think, it was, I can't remember off the top of my head, it was very low, it was like four or five PSI. And I bumped it all the way up to about 13 from memory. Anyway, so I put it on 13 and that thing was just, I, I can't put into words. Like, I, I, if if you do launch control in that thing, uh, I remember I had my sunnies on my head. So, you know, every now and then you just put your sunnies on your head. I'd launch control. Those sunnies are in the back seat. No exaggeration. Like, they, they literally uh, flew off my head in the back seat. That's how much G-Force it had. Jeez. How much more power did you get once you changed that ECU? Oh. It was noticeable, huh? Well, put it this way, standard, it's a supercar. And then it was noticeable on top of a supercar. Jesus. So I had, I was, I was in a forum where they were posting up their quarter mile times. Um, and there's, you know, for example, this person had these mods and they got this time and etc. Some person had the same setup as me and they got a 10.4 and standard, I think they're 10.8 or 10.9, which when you're looking at, so for example, let's just say it was 10.8 and I got 10.4. That 0.4 um, second isn't that big a deal if you're going from 20.4 to 20? Like, that's nothing. But, like, the faster you get, every second is just more and more impressive. So to go from 11 to 10 is impressive, but to go from 10 to 9 is even more impressive. All so right. it's just like, yeah. Um, I've actually lost my train of thought. Why would you get rid of it? I had an investment opportunity. Ah. So it was a grown-up decision. I'm like, keep the car or... <laughs> Do the investment. I had to have to go off and you well, know, get rid of it. I want to go back before we were talking about it, but have you looked at, into Teslas because they, the Tesla Roadster and, and the company as a whole and what Elon is doing 
if there is one car, like I, I, my car is like, I'm putting my investments elsewhere right now, but if there's one car that I will get in the future, it will probably be a Tesla. Have you looked into them? So yeah, they're, they're very, very impressive. Especially like you said, that road stuff. That I think it was zero to 100 in 1.9 seconds or something. Oh like yeah. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, def they're definitely be up there on, on my next, um, you know, one day car, one day car. So yeah, definitely. In saying that though, I'd say it's more so the enthusiast that would miss that would miss it. So, for example, if yeah, you yeah. always loved your V8s or something, it's never going to be the same in like that electric car. Mm. So that's I love the sound of V8s. I so, like I love the sound of the GDR. So I'd have to weigh up the options. Now, I'm never say never, but I, yeah, I just don't know. So the other example of you know the enthusiast thing would be I had an I had a Evo 10. Um, and it's probably the best example I can use to compare because they're both all-wheel drive. They're both, you know, extremely well handling cars. But the engineering of and the computer systems in the GDR are just, you know, they 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 do a lot of work for you. So you know that that sort of takes part, like takes over some of the driving experience if that's what you're into. Uh, whereas the the uh, Evo 10 that I had, again, it was worked. It was nowhere near as fast as the GDR, but it was still, you know, I. No, I'm not going to say what I did. Um, <laughs> so, so um, if you get in the in the in the Evo, you can feel everything. You can feel every corner. You can feel the road. There's a lot of like response from the from the road as well. Yeah. So you feel everything. So you have that driving experience. So that would definitely be a factor. Um, it just depends what you're into. Like some people just want you know pure as fast as possible, or some people actually want to feel the car. So yeah, I'd, I'd have to weigh that up. But it, it'd definitely be an option. That's yeah, but there's something about that, like. I don't know, for some people cars are just, it's just a point A to point B, but you know, uh, for me, it's like observing them, like watching, um, you know, iconic television shows like Top Gear really informed me, playing like video games like Gran Turismo really taught me actually a lot about cars um, and, and kind of stimulated my uh, interest and, and curiosity into them. And for some people, yeah, it's like A to B, but for some people, it's like this is this machine, this is a complex machine that also embodies art and creativity and you know it's it's a strange thing that we've created but that's also really really interesting and cool yeah yeah they, they're absolutely fascinating so and it's it's uh it's very interesting working on them like you see you see a i'm not, I'm not like super super good with cars like i know basics um but for example like you see a mechanic working on them and it's like, how do they know what they're doing? Like all these little things and so complex. But it's actually really interesting. My so on the Evo, I changed the suspension, and I didn't know what I was doing. Like I, you know, I learned how to do an oil change, so just basic stuff. Uh, but my dad had used uh, like obsessed with cars his whole life. Like he, my dad had the reaction time record on the one of the Queensland dragways, so he was like full into them. Wow. Uh, and he so like you know he's also working on cars and everything. So he taught me how to change the the suspension on on the Evo, which was it's actually very fun and like it's, it's cool to say like I know how to change the suspension on a car, right. and it's nowhere near as hard as what like a lot of people think. It's like obviously some some cars are going to be way harder. Um, you know, it wasn't easy. Uh, in saying that though, it's not as hard to learn as what you might think. Um, and yeah, that's just something that you know your average person should know how to do some basic stuff like change a tire change the oil you know you can save yourself some money and it's nowhere near as hard as to learn as what you might think yeah it would be. that's interesting it's like well what we do is we try and understand the human machine body as much as possible right we can talk all day about how to optimize the human machine but then when it comes to engineering and mechanics of a car well that's a different story you know quite a bit more than the average person but what about a computer and then what about um, microchip technology or how does this electricity work, right? What happens if, we, you know, we need, there's a soldering problem with certain wires, like, do we know how to fix that? It's like there's so many complexities that we take for granted. This whole system that is just intertwining, well, it relies on a bunch of different specialties. Like, people have to be specialists in their field to help each other and cohesively work as a, as a uh, society. Right, we rely on the engineers, then the doctors, and, and the um, this and then that fields to all work together. But it really makes you think. Hold on, what if I was just by myself, or was I with just a small group? Or like you're so vulnerable. Like 
we're really like our gardening. I've been really learning how to garden and forage off my, um, uh, you know, grow my own food. And like that's a whole nother skill because every plant has its own individual ways it prefers to grow and like width you have to plant them and, and type of conditions and soils and fertilizers. And it's like, hold on, we're so vulnerable. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. So I think, especially talking about this, I feel like there's certain things in life that everyone should be half decent at. Yeah. So, you know, for example, dieting, training, nutrition. You don't have to be a, a you know an elite level trainer, but I feel like everyone should at least know the basics on that. Um, like we were saying with the cars, you know, you know, let's say let's say you're out, I don't know, you're going on like an eight hour drive to wherever it is, uh, you're in the middle of nowhere and the tire pops. Let's say you got no cell reception, like what do you do? Like it's as simple as learning how to change a tire. So like just you don't have to be a mechanic, but like basic stuff, um, like gardening, something like that, or you know, mental health, just all the basic topics. Unfortunately, they never taught us all of these things in school. Like that would be an awesome class to go to, like life skills. Yeah. Um, but yeah, then we talk about how society interacts. Obviously, no one's going to know everything on every topic, but I feel like there's basic things everyone should know. And then if we look at uh, something more advanced, so let's say we all know how to change a tire, but no one knows how to change the suspension. Well, that's what we go to the mechanic for. Um, but yeah, you, you're, you're definitely right. Like your average person, if, you know, if we were five random people and we were stuck on an island somewhere, what do you do? Like no one knows, like your average person doesn't know how to hunt or, you know, prepare food or start a fire um, or create shelter or something like that. So we're very, very fortunate and very spoiled with what we have. Yeah, and, and we kind of obsess about the superfluous skills that, you know, society deems valuable because they pay money, like solving problems, I'm not saying like, like there's important problems to solve in society, we'll pay good people will pay good money for them um but uh, it just makes me think it's like you know the everyday man and woman you know like you said like there is a set of skills that should be prerequisites and it's something that i'm definitely coming to terms with now is like all right those things are important to me to be a capable man right the capable man the capable woman having the skills necessary to to uh be more autonomous and help the society and sphere around you when they need assistance. There's a real good example of how much people on average could improve or how much they don't take into account like day-to-day -day skills uh, that, you know, they should be half decent at. The bit easiest, easiest example in the world, how people drive. Like, in my in my eyes is if you're going to be doing something every day like you know if you're driving on the weekend and you don't know how to drive different story but if you drive to work every day you should be half decent at that skill whereas i'm sure you've seen i've seen everyone's seen the amount of hopeless drivers that are on the road it's like well why haven't you taught yourself how to be good at this like at least you don't have to be colin mccray doing you know burnouts and you know in the rally yard and all this stuff but why aren't you at least half decent at this skill that you're using every day depending like the average person how long are they driving like probably 30 minutes to work and 30 minutes back and you're not half decent at this skill but, like you should take it more seriously than what you're you're thinking about it and that obviously if they're using that skill in that way and they're not perfecting it to at least a decent level we can only imagine your average person how they're using their minds to your average yeah. skill in every other uh, area we get lazy we just it's autonomous like you you start driving the brain goes on autopilot, you've ingrained that pathway and you've walked it so many times and you don't need as much autonomous conscious control, right? But the stakes are so high when you're driving, like accidents and death and serious injury occurs every day. Um, yet there's nothing in place, to my knowledge in this country, that keeps you accountable to a certain skill set of driving level. Yeah. That's strange. Since you, meant, since you mentioned in this country, I just remember when I uh, traveled overseas, uh, like Southeast Asia, it was like Malaysia, Thailand, and a couple other ones. Oh. For example, in Thailand, the road rules Way are different. very, very, very different. Yeah. Very different. But what's so funny about it is, like I remember one of, one of the trips, I was there for a month. I was there for a very long time. And I didn't see one accident. Like not one, I was outside constantly, like going here, going there. You know, on their you know tuk tuks and all those things, and not one accident. 
Uh, but the difference is, I feel like everyone there is like, they're, they're on. It's like, we're driving, I'm paying attention. What are we doing right now? Whereas like a lot of people these days, like on the phone or, you know, just paying it no mind, their mind is like we're saying, you know, they're not focusing on the present moment, you know, mind's past, future, wherever it is, and they're getting distracted. So even though it is a habit and they're, you know, they have the unconscious skill to drive, well, if you're obsessing on something too much, well, then you're going to be focusing, putting too much of your focus here. Uh, but yes, yeah, it's, it's just very, very interesting where, you know, you could you could stop so many accidents and so much, uh, you know, tragedy on the road just by focusing on what you're doing and, you know, putting some effort into what you're doing. It's just, it's, it's actually fascinating how something as simple as a reverse park, uh, was it, it was yesterday, yesterday I was stuck behind, like there was actually... I think it was like 10 or 20 car lineup just for someone to reverse park and they had like freaking five attempts and it was, i I'd pass it and i'm like that's a big spot and you just think you're like why haven't you got half decent at this like why it's so, so yeah funny. there's so many examples of that i mean there's so many things to focus on in life that we could focus on and it's i think people they we accept bare minimums in certain skills right oh, i'm just going to do the bare minimum I'm just going to cook just just to get by, just to feed myself as whatever I need, right? Just like, um, you know, it's such a bare minimum, yet it's the nutrients that support your vitality and health for your whole life. Or, or, or that, uh, you know, it's we accept mediocrity quite often, but we also have to in certain areas because in some other skills we have to go harder in. We have to put more resources in. But there's a lot of superfluous time that I believe is wasted that we could all agree on individually and as a whole it's like, okay, guys, we know we can drive this ship a little bit better if, if we partition these resources a bit more effectively. Yeah, that's, and the, one of the biggest uh, sort of solid proof uh, that we have of that would be something as simple as uh, the iPhone screen time or if you use another app. Yeah. So, so many people sort of look at that and they're just like, oh, probably on the, on the phone for like an hour a day. And then you look at their screen time and it's like three, four hours. Um, and you're like, well, three, four hours. Like, what else do you do besides sleep? That's three, four hours a day. But that's, apart from sleep, that's the thing you're spending the most time doing, you know, apart from work. So let's say sleep and work. Well, your leisure activity is basically on that phone. Yeah. Whereas, you know, that's four hours you could be spending doing something productive. Um, Dude, I was I was um, teaching my Cert 3 and 4 students and I got them to do that experiment. We all to look at our screen time. And they told me the numbers, and these guys, guys and girls are a bit younger, early twenties, late teens, and I'm hearing, I'm hearing higher numbers. I'm hearing five, sixes, and even sevens. And you know, it's really interesting because that's common. Yeah. Like that's not uncommon. It's like, yeah. what do you even do with that? Like, well, I think where you start is just all right. Let's get it down to six. Yeah, and slowly progress. Then five. <laughs> oh, no. you know, if it's important to you. Yeah, yeah. I think um, a good strategy to do with that, because I'll, uh, how can we say, if they're a reasonable person, a lot of people don't realize, first of all, how much um, time they're actually spending on that, on the on their device. But most reasonable people, if you ask them, you're like, well, how much, how many hours do you feel like you should be spending a day? Yeah. Most people will say way less than what they're doing. Like they say, well, maybe an hour or two. Like, yeah. all right, well, don't you think you should shoot for that? And it's a bit of a wake up call That's for good. them. And again, it's like with many bad habits, most people don't even realize how bad it is or how bad it's affecting them. Like, for example, Alcoholics Anonymous, the first step to change is admitting you have a problem. And, you know, if you don't realize you have, your pro have a problem, well, then you're never going to fix that problem. So, so, speaking of that, when you were younger, you mentioned a particular one you or you had. Like, did you want to tell that story and, and explain it a little bit? So, my addiction when I was younger uh, was porn. So, okay. when I was younger, it's it's common, you know. Every, it's every very common. Yeah, every guy you know watches, you know, all my mates. Just a common thing. You don't think nothing of it, and especially. I mean, even to this day, most people don't realize you can be addicted to things other than drugs. So again, that was my that was my paradigm of how that all works. Yeah. And so, yeah, going a little bit personal, but I don't mind. So, I was with my ex, so my first girlfriend, and the same thing is how I explained how dopamine works. That's that's basically what I realized. So, I realized I had a problem. I, as, as messed up as this sounds, 
I would have my girlfriend come over, spend time. I actually couldn't wait for her to go home so I could watch porn. Mm. And then eventually I'm like, well, this is a, there's something wrong with me. Like, what, what's wrong with me? This isn't normal. I should be wanting to spend time with my girlfriend. Um, and then that's where I started doing a bit of research about it. And I figured out, I'm like, well, I, I have an addiction. I've got to do something about this. Uh, and then from there, it was, it wasn't, it, it actually wasn't hard to get over it, like to, to get, to beat the addiction because I didn't realize I was addicted. Like if I knew it was an addiction, I wouldn't have done it in the first place. So mine, it was, again, it was unconscious. I didn't realize I was doing something wrong. It, it was just normal to me. So anyway, eventually told her everything. We talked about it and, you know, she was understanding. So I just basically stopped everything and dealt with it. And yeah, from there, I just have a look back. Like I, I know the damage it does to you. And don't get me wrong. Everyone's human. Any, everyone slips up with, you know, things time to time. But the difference is you try and make that improvement long term and you understand what it's doing to you. So, you know, it's you'd have to be silly to to know that something's doing so much damage to you, you having overcome that, and then, you know, you might fall, you might you might mess up every now and then, but sure. to not constantly want to get out of that. Yeah. So I think that's that's what would, you know, help with, you know, a lot of people's addictions. Just like I keep saying, the education, just the knowledge of it. In saying that though, I've got a I've got a saying that I always say like, um, habits are more important than knowledge, which yeah. is the same thing as sort of saying, you know, how many people know they have to diet right, yet they don't do it. So it's like, well, knowledge only plays so much to factor in all of that as well. Absolutely. I appreciate you sharing that. And it's very common, and we have talked about it many times on my podcast with various people. And if you could go back in time, or, you know, what would you tell that? Well, you got through it, but what would you tell people now who are going through it? Because there's very likely at least one person who's going through that version of that for themselves. Like, what do you tell them to get through it? I'd, I'd say try to try to gain a decent understanding of, of how addictions work and what it's actually doing to your neurochemistry. Um, and again, that's they don't have to go like deep dive into, you know, me or Dave's level or anything like that. Sure. Just the basics, like just like stuff that I've explained here, like, you know, the the grass example or, you know, the 10 dopamine example, like that's enough, that's enough of an understanding to know what it's doing. And once you understand what this addiction is doing to you, you realize that this addiction is actually dulling the rest of my life. So all these things that I should be enjoying in life, I can't enjoy because this has messed up my receptors. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't, don't uh, appreciate the value of how much these have to play, uh, like a part to play on who you are. So an example I like to use um, with neurotransmitters, because a lot of people sort of counter you when they're like, oh, you know, you should just tough it out and you should just, you know, overcome and willpower and this and that. And it's like, yeah, th that's definitely a part to play. It can be done. But my favorite example is, all right, if you don't think neurotransmitters play a part in how we work, how about I give you some MDMA and you act sober? <laughs> you can't act sober because, you know, serotonin's in friggin' overload and you're a different person right now because you're on a, you know, you're on a drug uh, and it just can't be done. So, Obviously, it's going to be at a, a smaller scale than, uh, than MDMA, but in saying that, that should sort of show them the impact of what that can be doing to them. And especially something like dopamine, just dopamine is next level important. Um, another example what I use for my clients to get them to understand how important dopamine is, there was a experiment they did with, and don't quote me word for word, it was along the lines of this, uh, experiment they did with uh, mice or rats. And they made sure that the mice rats were hungry before the experiment, so they starved them. And I don't know how, they, I don't know what method they used, but they chemically uh, took out or reduced all of this rat's dopamine. So the test they used, again, was food because they were starving. They put the rat in the middle of whatever they did, oh, yeah. and they put a piece of food on the other side of the room. The rat didn't move. Put the food closer to the rat, rat didn't move. Put the food closer to the rat, rat didn't move. Put the food on the rat's stomach didn't move, put the food on the rat's chest, didn't move, put the food on the rat's chin, didn't move. And this rat's starving. So he didn't have the motivation to grab that food and eat it. It wasn't until they put the food into the rat's mouth that he actually ate the food. Oh. So that's how important dopamine is. And if you're addicted to anything, any addiction comes from dopamine. So hopefully that gives you an understanding of what it's actually doing to, to people's systems. It's just, it's insane, the effect that it's having. It's ridiculous. Woo. Andrew, I don't know if you realize, but we've been going for over two hours. Um, time has flied, my friend, and 
Man, I feel like we we got to do a round two sometime. Uh, hopefully in person. You down for that? Definitely, man. Once all those things clear up down in Melbourne, I'm in. What, now, where are you again? I'm in uh, Sydney. Okay, that's right. All right, yes. Well, whenever that happens, we will make it happen. Definitely, you, man. You, I'm really grateful for to, for doing this and, and connecting and um, speaking like this because I feel like this conversation was uh, really interesting and valuable and enjoyable for me. And I hope it was for you. But for you got any last comments, thoughts, um, asks of the audience or where just where people can find you? Uh, so you can find me on Instagram. Uh, it's just at Andrew Maneshian, so just first and last name. Um, and yeah, guys, hopefully the biggest thing that you take away from this is the things that you can do to improve your life and just how much of an effect all the little things that we think are common in our society um, and how much of a negative effect they can have on you and what you can do to improve them. And you shouldn't feel overwhelmed about all of this. You've got to start small and just start with the things you can control and always ask yourself, whatever you're trying to change, ask yourself the question, out of 10, do I feel like I could accomplish this, whatever I'm setting out to do? If the answer is anything less than 10, make that objective easier for yourself hmm. just so that you know 100% you're headed in that direction as opposed to never moving anywhere at all. Um, and apart from that, man, I appreciate you having me on and... You know, I'm definitely down to go for another round whenever you can. Absolutely. It was a pleasure, Andrew. And uh, we'll do it again in person. I'm glad to be the first guy to uh, be able to pop that podcast cherry and get you on and talk about your life. Beautiful, man. Thank you so much for it. You're welcome, man. We'll speak soon. Have a good one, buddy. You too. Bye. You are watching, talking, or listening to Talking Chimps. Do you expect us to behave? Do you expect a chimp to behave in a zoo? And how are you going to expect us to behave? We're in a fucking zoo. It's called the fucking planet. Spinning around in a marble, hurling through space, wondering when the fuck we're going to get off this ride. Never. We're stuck. And we're in a Milky Way, which is in another universe, in another universe, in another universe, in another universe.